Part 1. Has many passages which recall Troilus and Cressida. Mr. Flea's speculation as to its date will be found in his Chronicle History of the English Drama, I, page 285. For the same writer's ingenious theory, which is of course incapable of proof, regarding the relation of the player's speech in Hamlet to Marlowe and Nash's Dido, see Furness's Variorum Hamlet. Note G. Hamlet's Apology to Laertes. Johnson, in commenting on the passage, v. 2. 237 to 255, says, I wish Hamlet had made some other defense, it is unsuitable to the character of a good or a brave man to shelter himself in falsehood. And Seymour, according to Furness, thought the falsehood so ignoble that he rejected lines 239 to 250 as an interpolation. I wish first to remark that we are mistaken when we suppose that Hamlet is here apologizing specially for his behavior to Laertes at Ophelia's grave. We naturally suppose this because he has told Horatio that he is sorry he forgot himself on that occasion, and that he will court Laertes' favors, v. 2. 75 ff. But what he says in that very passage shows that he is thinking chiefly of the greater wrong he has done Laertes by depriving him of his father. For, by the image of my cause, I see the portraiture of his. And it is also evident in the last words of the Apology itself that he is referring in it to the deaths of Polonius and Ophelia. Sir, in this audience, let my disclaiming from a purposed evil free me so far in your most generous thoughts that I have shot mine arrow o'er the house and hurt my brother. But now, as to the falsehood, the charge is not to be set aside lightly. And, for my part, I confess that, while rejecting of course Johnson's notion that Shakespeare wanted to paint, a good man, I have momentarily shared Johnson's wish that Hamlet had made, some other defense, than that of madness. But I think the wish proceeds from failure to imagine the situation. In the first place, what other defense can we wish Hamlet to have made? I can think of none. He cannot tell the truth. He cannot say to Laertes, I meant to stab the king, not your father. He cannot explain why he was unkind to Ophelia. Even on the false supposition that he is referring simply to his behavior at the grave, he can hardly say, I suppose, you ranted so abominably that you put me into a towering passion. Whatever he said, it would have to be more or less untrue. Next, what moral difference is there between feigning insanity and asserting it? If we are to blame Hamlet for the second, why not equally for the first? And, finally, even if he were referring simply to his behavior at the grave, his excuse, besides falling in with his whole plan of feigning insanity, would be as near the truth as any he could devise. For we are not to take the account he gives to Horatio, that he was put in a passion by the bravery of Laertes' grief, as the whole truth. His raving over the grave is not mere acting. On the contrary, that passage is the best card that the believers in Hamlet's madness have to play. He is really almost beside himself with grief as well as anger, half maddened by the impossibility of explaining to Laertes how he has come to do what he has done. Full of wild rage and then of sick despair at this wretched world which drives him to such deeds and such misery. It is the same rage and despair that mingle with other feelings in his outbreak to Ophelia in the nunnery scene. But of all this, even if he were clearly conscious of it, he cannot speak to Horatio. For his love to Ophelia is a subject on which he has never opened his lips to his friend. If we realize the situation, then, we shall, I think, repress the wish that Hamlet had, made some other defense, than that of madness. We shall feel only tragic sympathy. As I have referred to Hamlet's apology, I will add a remark on it from a different point of view. It forms another refutation of the theory that Hamlet has delayed his vengeance till he could publicly convict the king, and that he has come back to Denmark because now, with the evidence of the commission in his pocket, he can safely accuse him. If that were so, what better opportunity could he possibly find than this occasion, where he has to express his sorrow to Laertes for the grievous wrongs which he has unintentionally inflicted on him? Note H. The Exchange of Rapiers I am not going to discuss the question how this exchange ought to be managed. 
I wish merely to point out that the stage direction fails to show the sequence of speeches and events. The passage is as follows, globe text. Ham. Come, for the third, Laertes, you but dally. I pray you, pass with your best violence. I am afeard you make a wanton of me. La. Say you so. Come on. They play. O.S.R. Nothing, neither way. La. Have at you now. Laertes wounds Hamlet, then, in scuffling, they. Change rapiers, and Hamlet wounds Laertes. King. Part them, they are incensed. Ham. Nay, come, again. The queen falls. O.S.R. Look to the queen there, ho. Whore. They bleed on both sides. How is it, my lord? O.S.R. How is t, Laertes? The words, and Hamlet wounds Laertes in Rose stage direction destroy the point of the words given to the king in the text. If Laertes is already wounded, why should the king care whether the fencers are parted or not? What makes him cry out is that, while he sees his purpose effected as regards Hamlet, he also sees Laertes in danger through the exchange of foils in the scuffle. Now it is not to be supposed that Laertes is particularly dear to him. But he sees instantaneously that, if Laertes escapes the poison foil, he will certainly hold his tongue about the plot against Hamlet, while, if he is wounded, he may confess the truth. For it is no doubt quite evident to the king that Laertes has fenced tamely because his conscience is greatly troubled by the treachery he is about to practice. The king therefore, as soon as he sees the exchange of foils, cries out, part them. They are incensed. But Hamlet's blood is up. Nay, come, again, he calls to Laertes, who cannot refuse to play, and now is wounded by Hamlet. At the very same moment the queen falls to the ground. And ruin rushes on the king from the right hand and the left. The passage, therefore, should be printed thus. La. Have at you now. Laertes wounds Hamlet, then, in scuffling, they change rapiers. King. Part them they are incensed. Ham. Nay, come, again. They play, and Hamlet wounds Laertes. The queen falls. Footnotes. So row. The direction in Q1 is negligible, the text being different. Q2 etc. have nothing, ff, simply, in scuffling they change rapiers. Capel. The quartos and folios have no directions. Note I. The duration of the action in Othello. The quite unusual difficulties regarding this subject have led to much discussion, a synopsis of which may be found in Furness's Variorum edition, pp. 358-72. Without detailing the facts I will briefly set out the main difficulty, which is that, according to one set of indications, which I will call a, Desdemona was murdered within a day or two of her arrival in Cyprus, while, According to another set, which I will call B, some time elapsed between her arrival and the catastrophe. Let us take a first, and run through the play. A, Act I, opens on the night of Othello's marriage. On that night he is dispatched to Cyprus, leaving Desdemona to follow him. In Act II, SCI, they arrive at Cyprus, first, in one ship, Cassio. Then, in another, Desdemona, Iago, and Emilia, then, in another, Othello, Othello, Cassio, and Desdemona being in three different ships, it does not matter, for our purpose, how long the voyage lasted. On the night following these arrivals in Cyprus the marriage is consummated, too. 3, 9, Cassio is cashiered, and, on Iago's advice, he resolves to ask Desdemona's intercession, betimes in the morning, too. 3, 335. In Act 3. SC 3. The temptation scene, he does so, Desdemona does intercede, Iago begins to poison Othello's mind, the handkerchief is lost, found by Emilia, and given to Iago, he determines to leave it in Cassio's room, and, renewing his attack on Othello. 
asserts that he has seen the handkerchief in Cassio's hand, Othello bids him kill Cassio within three days, and resolves to kill Desdemona himself. All this occurs in one unbroken scene, and evidently on the day after the arrival in Cyprus, c. 3. i. 33. In the scene, 4. Following the temptation scene Desdemona sends to bid Cassio come, as she has interceded for him, Othello enters, tests her about the handkerchief, and departs in anger, Cassio, arriving, is told of the change in Othello, and, being left solace, is accosted by Bianca, whom he requests to copy the work on the handkerchief which he has just found in his room, LL. 188F. All this is naturally taken to happen in the later part of the day on which the events of 3. 1 to 3 took place, i.e., the day after the arrival in Cyprus, but I shall return to this point. In 4. I. Iago tells Othello that Cassio has confessed, and, placing Othello where he can watch, he proceeds on Cassio's entrance to rally him about Bianca. And Othello, not being near enough to hear what is said, believes that Cassio is laughing at his conquest of Desdemona. Cassio here says that Bianca haunts him and was here even now. And Bianca herself, coming in, reproaches him about the handkerchief, you gave me even now. There is therefore no appreciable time between three. Four, and four. I, in this same scene Bianca bids Cassio come to supper tonight. And Lodovico, arriving, is asked to sup with Othello tonight. In four. Two, Iago persuades Rodrigo to kill Cassio that night as he comes from Bianca's. In four. Three. Lodovico, after supper, takes his leave, and Othello bids Desdemona go to bed on the instant and dismiss her attendant. In Act V, that night, the attempted assassination of Cassio, and the murder of Desdemona, take place. From all this, then, it seems clear that the time between the arrival in Cyprus and the catastrophe is certainly not more than a few days, and most probably only about a day and a half, or, to put it otherwise, that most probably Othello kills his wife about twenty-four hours after the consummation of their marriage. The only possible place, it will be seen, where time can elapse is between three. Three, and three. Four, and here Mr. Flea would imagine a gap of at least a week. The reader will find that this supposition involves the following results, a, Desdemona has allowed at least a week to elapse without telling Cassio that she has interceded for him. b, Othello, after being convinced of her guilt, after resolving to kill her, and after ordering Iago to kill Cassio within three days, has allowed at least a week to elapse without even questioning her about the handkerchief. And has so behaved during all this time that she is totally unconscious of any change in his feelings. C. Desdemona, who reserves the handkerchief evermore about her to kiss and talk to, 3. 3. 295, has lost it for at least a week before she is conscious of the loss. D. Iago has waited at least a week to leave the handkerchief in Cassio's chamber, for Cassio has evidently only just found it, and wants the work on it copied before the owner makes inquiries for it. These are all gross absurdities. It is certain that only a short time, most probable that not even a night, elapses between three. Three, and three. Four. B. Now this idea that Othello killed his wife, probably within twenty-four hours, certainly within a few days, of the consummation of his marriage, contradicts the impression produced by the play on all uncritical readers and spectators. It is also in flat contradiction with a large number of time indications in the play itself. It is needless to mention more than a few. a. Bianca complains that Cassio has kept away from her for a week, 3. 4. 173. Cassio and the rest have therefore been more than a week in Cyprus, and, we should naturally infer, considerably more. b. The ground on which Iago builds throughout is the probability of Desdemona's having got tired of the moor. She is accused of having repeatedly committed adultery with Cassio, e.g. v. 2. 210. These facts and a great many others, such as Othello's language in 3. 3. 338 ff. 
are utterly absurd on the supposition that he murders his wife within a day or two of the night when he consummated his marriage. See, Iago's account of Cassio's dream implies, and indeed states, that he had been sleeping with Cassio lately, i.e. After arriving at Cyprus, yet, according to A, he had only spent one night in Cyprus, and we are expressly told that Cassio never went to bed on that night. Iago doubtless was a liar, but Othello was not an absolute idiot. Thus, one, one set of time indications clearly shows that Othello murdered his wife within a few days, probably a day and a half, of his arrival in Cyprus and the consummation of his marriage. Two, another set of time indications implies quite as clearly that some little time must have elapsed, probably a few weeks, and this last is certainly the impression of a reader who has not closely examined the play. It is impossible to escape this result. The suggestion that the imputed intrigue of Cassio and Desdemona took place at Venice before the marriage, not at Cyprus after it, is quite futile. There is no positive evidence whatever for it. If the reader will merely refer to the difficulties mentioned under B above, he will see that it leaves almost all of them absolutely untouched, and Iago's accusation is uniformly one of adultery. How then is this extraordinary contradiction to be explained? It can hardly be one of the casual inconsistencies, due to forgetfulness, which are found in Shakespeare's other tragedies. For the scheme of time indicated under A seems deliberate and self-consistent, and the scheme indicated under B seems, if less deliberate, equally self-consistent. This does not look as if a single scheme had been so vaguely imagined that inconsistencies arose in working it out, it points to some other source of contradiction. Christopher North, who dealt very fully with the question, elaborated a doctrine of double time, short and long. To do justice to this theory in a few words is impossible, but its essence is the notion that Shakespeare, consciously or unconsciously, wanted to produce on the spectator, for he did not aim at readers, two impressions. He wanted the spectator to feel a passionate and vehement haste in the action, but he also wanted him to feel that the action was fairly probable. Consciously or unconsciously he used short time, the scheme of A, for the first purpose, and long time, the scheme of B, for the second. The spectator is affected in the required manner by both, though without distinctly noticing the indications of the two schemes. The notion underlying this theory is probably true, but the theory itself can hardly stand. Passing minor matters by, I would ask the reader to consider the following remarks. A. If, as seems to be maintained, the spectator does not notice the indications of short time at all, how can they possibly affect him? The passion, vehemence and haste of Othello affect him, because he perceives them. But if he does not perceive the hints which show the duration of the action from the arrival in Cyprus to the murder, these hints have simply no existence for him and are perfectly useless. The theory, therefore, does not explain the existence of short time. b. It is not the case that short time is wanted only to produce an impression of vehemence and haste, and long time for probability. The short time is equally wanted for probability, for it is grossly improbable that Iago's intrigue should not break down if Othello spends a week or weeks between the successful temptation and his execution of justice. c. And this brings me to the most important point, which appears to have escaped notice. The place where long time is wanted is not within Iago's intrigue. Long time is required simply and solely because the intrigue and its circumstances presuppose a marriage consummated, and an adultery possible, for, let us say, some weeks. But, granted that lapse between the marriage and the temptation, there is no reason whatever why more than a few days or even one day should elapse between this temptation and the murder. The whole trouble arises because the temptation begins on the morning after the consummated marriage. Let some three weeks elapse between the first night at Cyprus and the temptation. Let the brawl which ends in the disgrace of Cassio occur not on that night but three weeks later, or again let it occur that night, but let three weeks elapse before the intercession of Desdemona and the temptation of Iago begin. All will then be clear. Cassio has time to make acquaintance with Bianca, and to neglect her, the Senate has time to hear of the perdition of the Turkish fleet and to recall Othello, the accusations of Iago cease to be ridiculous. 
and the headlong speed of the action after the temptation has begun is quite in place. Now, too, there is no reason why we should not be affected by the hints of time, today, tonight, even now, which we do perceive, though we do not calculate them out. And, lastly, this supposition corresponds with our natural impression, which is that the temptation and what follows it take place some little while after the marriage, but occupy, themselves, a very short time. Now, of course, the supposition just described is no fact. As the play stands, it is quite certain that there is no space of three weeks, or anything like it, either between the arrival in Cyprus and the brawl, or between the brawl and the temptation. And I draw attention to the supposition chiefly to show that quite a small change would remove the difficulties, and to insist that there is nothing wrong at all in regard to the time from the temptation onward. How to account for the existing contradictions I do not at all profess to know, and I will merely mention two possibilities. Possibly, as Mr. Daniel observes, the play has been tampered with. We have no text earlier than 1622, six years after Shakespeare's death. It may be suggested, then, that in the play, as Shakespeare wrote it, there was a gap of some weeks between the arrival in Cyprus and Cassio's brawl, or, less probably, between the brawl and the temptation. Perhaps there was a scene indicating the lapse of time. Perhaps it was dull, or the play was a little too long, or devotees of the unity of time made sport of a second breach of that unity coming just after the breach caused by the voyage. Perhaps accordingly the owners of the play altered, or hired a dramatist to alter, the arrangement at this point, and this was unwittingly done in such a way as to produce the contradictions we are engaged on. There is nothing intrinsically unlikely in this idea, and certainly, I think, the amount of such corruption of Shakespeare's texts by the players is usually rather underrated than otherwise. But I cannot say I see any signs of foreign alteration in the text, though it is somewhat odd that Roderigo, who makes no complaint on the day of the arrival in Cyprus when he is being persuaded to draw Cassio into a quarrel that night, should. Directly after the quarrel, 2. 3. 370. Complain that he is making no advance in his pursuit of Desdemona, and should speak as though he had been in Cyprus long enough to have spent nearly all the money he brought from Venice. Or, possibly, Shakespeare's original plan was to allow some time to elapse after the arrival at Cyprus, but when he reached the point he found it troublesome to indicate this lapse in an interesting way. And convenient to produce Cassio's fall by means of the rejoicings on the night of the arrival, and then almost necessary to let the request for intercession, and the temptation, follow on the next day. And perhaps he said to himself, no one in the theatre will notice that all this makes an impossible position, and I can make all safe by using language that implies that Othello has after all been married for some time. If so, probably he was right. I do not think anyone does notice the impossibilities either in the theatre or in a casual reading of the play. Either of these suppositions is possible, neither is, to me, probable. The first seems the less unlikely. If the second is true, Shakespeare did in Othello what he seems to do in no other play. I can believe that he may have done so, but I find it very hard to believe that he produced this impossible situation without knowing it. It is one thing to read a drama or see it, quite another to construct and compose it, and he appears to have imagined the action in Othello with even more than his usual intensity. Note J. The additions to Othello in the first folio. The Pontic C. The first printed Othello is the first quarto, Q1, 1622, the second is the first folio, F1, 1623. These two texts are two distinct versions of the play. Q1 contains many oaths and expletives where less objectionable expressions occur in F1. Partly for this reason it is believed to represent the earlier text, perhaps the text as it stood before the Act of 1605 against profanity on the stage. Its readings are frequently superior to those of F1, but it wants many lines that appear in F1, which probably represents the acting version in 1623. I give a list of the longer passages absent from Q1. A. I. I. 122 to 138. Ift. Yourself. B. I. 272 to 77. Judge. V. 
c. i. 3. 24 to 30. 4. Profitless. d. 3. 3. 383 to 390. Off. By. Satisfied. Iago. E. 3. 3. 453 to 460. Iago. Heaven. F. 4. I. 38 to 44. To confess. Devil. G. 4. 2. 73 to 76. Committed. Committed. H. 4, 2. 151 to 164. Here. Make me. I. 4, 3. 31 to 53. I have. Not next. And 55 to 57. Des. Singing. Men. J. 4, 3. 60 to 63. I have. Question. K. 4, 3. 87 to 104. But I. Us so. L. V. 2. 151 to 154. O Mistress. Iago. M. V. 2. 185 to 193. My Mistress. Villani. N. V. 2. 266 to 272. Be not. Wench. Were these passages afterthoughts, composed after the version represented by Q1 was written? Or were they in the version represented by Q1, and only omitted in printing, whether accidentally or because they were also omitted in the theater? Or were some of them afterthoughts, and others in the original version? I will take them in order. A. Can hardly be an afterthought. Up to that point Rodrigo had hardly said anything, for Iago had always interposed. And it is very unlikely that Rodrigo would now deliver but four lines, and speak at once of, she, instead of, your daughter. Probably this omission represents a, cut, in stage performance. B. This may also be the case here. In our texts the omission of the passage would make nonsense, but in Q1 the cut, if a cut, has been mended, awkwardly enough, by the substitution of, such, for, for, in line 78. In any case, the lines cannot be an addition. C. Cannot be an afterthought, for the sentence is unfinished without it, and that it was not meant to be interrupted is clear, because in Q1 line 31 begins, and, not, nay. The Duke might say, nay, if he were cutting the previous speaker short, but not, and. D, is surely no addition. If the lines are cut out, not only is the meter spoilt, but the obvious reason for Iago's words, I see, sir, you are eaten up with passion, disappears, and so does the reference of his word, satisfied, in 393 to Othello's, satisfied, in 390. E, is the famous passage about the Pontic Sea, and I reserve it for the present. F, as Pope observes, no hint of this trash in the first edition, that a trash, including the words, nature would not invest herself in such shadowing passion without some instruction. It is not words that shake me thus. There is nothing to prove these lines to be original or an afterthought. The omission of, g, is clearly a printer's error, due to the fact that lines 72 and 76 both end with the word, committed. No conclusion can be formed as to, h, nor perhaps, i, which includes the whole of Desdemona's song, but if, j, is removed the reference in, such a deed, in 64 is destroyed. k, is Amelia's long speech about husbands. It cannot well be an afterthought, for 105 to 6 evidently refer to 103 to 4, even the word, uses, in 105 refers to, use, in 103. L, is no afterthought, for, if he says so, in 155 must point back to, my husband say that she was false, in 152. M, 
might be an afterthought, but, if so, in the first version the ending, to speak, occurred twice within three lines, and the reason for Iago's sudden alarm in 193 is much less obvious. If, n, is an addition the original collocation was. But O vain boast. Who can control his fate? Tis not so now. Pale as thy smock. Which does not sound probable. Thus, as it seems to me, in the great majority of cases there is more or less reason to think that the passages wanting in Q1 were nevertheless parts of the original play. And I cannot in any one case see any positive ground for supposing a subsequent edition. I think that most of the gaps in Q1 were accidents of printing, like many other smaller gaps in Q1, but that probably one or two were, cuts, e.g. Amelia's long speech, k. The omission of, I, might be due to the state of the MS. The words of the song may have been left out of the dialogue, as appearing on a separate page with the musical notes, or may have been inserted in such an illegible way as to baffle the printer. I come now to, e, the famous passage about the Pontic Sea. Pope supposed that it formed part of the original version, but approved of its omission, as he considered it, an unnatural excursion in this place. Mr. Swinburne thinks it an afterthought, but defends it. In other lips indeed than Othello's, at the crowning minute of culminant agony. The rush of imaginative reminiscence which brings back upon his eyes and ears the lightning foam and tideless thunder of the Pontic Sea might seem a thing less natural than sublime. But Othello has the passion of a poet closed in as it were and shut up behind the passion of a hero, study of Shakespeare, page 184. I quote these words all the more gladly because they will remind the reader of my lectures of my debt to Mr. Swinburne here, and I will only add that the reminiscence here is of precisely the same character as the reminiscences of the Arabian trees and the base Indian in Othello's final speech. But I find it almost impossible to believe that Shakespeare ever wrote the passage without the words about the Pontic Sea. It seems to me almost an imperative demand of imagination that Iago's set speech, if I may use the phrase, should be preceded by a speech of somewhat the same dimensions, the contrast of which should heighten the horror of its hypocrisy. It seems to me that Shakespeare must have felt this. And it is difficult to me to think that he ever made the lines. In the due reverence of a sacred vow. I here engage my words. Follow directly on the one word, never, however impressive that word in its isolation might be. And as I can find no other, omission, in Q1 which appears to point to a subsequent edition, I conclude that this omission, was an omission, probably accidental, conceivably due to a stupid, cut. Indeed it is nothing but Mr. Swinburne's opinion that prevents my feeling certainty on the point. Finally, I may draw attention to certain facts which may be mere accidents, but may possibly be significant. Passages, B, and, C, consist respectively of six and seven lines. That is, they are almost of the same length, and in a MS might well fill exactly the same amount of space. Passage, D, is eight lines long, so is passage, E. Now, taking at random two editions of Shakespeare, the Globe and that of Delius, I find that, B, and, C, are six and a quarter inches apart in the Globe, eight in Delius, and that, D, and, E, are separated by seven and three-eighths inches in the Globe, by eight and three-quarters in Delius. In other words, there is about the same distance in each case between two passages of about equal dimensions. The idea suggested by these facts is that the MS from which Q1 was printed was mutilated in various places. That, B, and, C, occupied the bottom inches of two successive pages, and that these inches were torn away, and that this was also the case with, D, and, E. This speculation has amused me and may amuse some reader. I do not know enough of Elizabethan manuscripts to judge of its plausibility. Note K. Othello's Courtship. It is curious that in the first act two impressions are produced which have afterwards to be corrected. 1. We must not suppose that Othello's account of his courtship in his famous speech before the Senate is intended to be exhaustive. He is accused of having used drugs or charms in order to win Desdemona. 
and therefore his purpose in his defense is merely to show that his witchcraft was the story of his life. It is no part of his business to trouble the senators with the details of his courtship, and he so condenses his narrative of it that it almost appears as though there was no courtship at all. And as though Desdemona never imagined that he was in love with her until she had practically confessed her love for him. Hence she has been praised by some for her courage, and blamed by others for her forwardness. But at 3. 3, 70 f, matters are presented in quite a new light. There we find the following words of hers. What? Michael Cassio. That came a wooing with you, and so many a time. When I have spoke of you dispraisingly. Hath tain your part. It seems, then, she understood why Othello came so often to her father's house, and was perfectly secure of his love before she gave him that very broad hint to speak. I may add that those who find fault with her forget that it was necessary for her to take the first open step. She was the daughter of a Venetian grandee, and Othello was a black soldier of fortune. 2. We learn from the lines just quoted that Cassio used to accompany Othello in his visits to the house, and from 3. 3. 93f we learn that he knew of Othello's love from first to last and went between the lovers very oft. Yet in Act I. It appears that, while Iago on the night of the marriage knows about it and knows where to find Othello, I, I, 158f, Cassio, even if he knows where to find Othello, which is doubtful, ci, 2. 44, seems to know nothing about the marriage. ci, 2. 49. Cass. Ancient, what makes he here? Iago. Faith, he tonight hath boarded a land carrack. If it prove lawful prize, he's made for ever. Cass. I do not understand. Iago. He's married. Cass. To who? It is possible that Cassio does know, and only pretends ignorance because he has not been informed by Othello that Iago also knows. And this idea is consistent with Iago's apparent ignorance of Cassio's part in the courtship, 3. 3, 93. And of course, if this were so, a word from Shakespeare to the actor who played Cassio would enable him to make all clear to the audience. The alternative, and perhaps more probable, explanation would be that, in writing Act I, Shakespeare had not yet thought of making Cassio Othello's confidant, and that, after writing Act Three, he neglected to alter the passage in Act I. In that case the further information which Act Three gives regarding Othello's courtship would probably also be an afterthought. Note L. Othello in the Temptation Scene One reason why some readers think Othello easily jealous is that they completely misinterpret him in the early part of this scene. They fancy that he is alarmed and suspicious the moment he hears Iago mutter, Ha! Huh. I like not that, as he sees Cassio leaving Desdemona, 3. 3, 35. But, in fact, it takes a long time for Iago to excite surprise, curiosity, and then grave concern, by no means yet jealousy, even about Cassio. And it is still longer before Othello understands that Iago is suggesting doubts about Desdemona too. Wronged in 143 certainly does not refer to her, as 154 and 162 show. Nor, even at 171, is the exclamation Oh misery meant for an expression of Othello's own present feelings. As his next speech clearly shows, it expresses an imagined feeling, as also the speech which elicits it professes to do, for Iago would not have dared here to apply the term cuckold to Othello. In fact it is not until Iago hints that Othello, as a foreigner, might easily be deceived, that he is seriously disturbed about Desdemona. Salvini played this passage, as might be expected, with entire understanding. Nor have I ever seen it seriously misinterpreted on the stage. I gather from the Furnace Variorum that Fector and Edwin Booth took the same view as Salvini. Actors have to ask themselves what was the precise state of mind expressed by the words they have to repeat. But many readers never think of asking such a question. The lines which probably do most to lead hasty or unimaginative readers astray are those at 90, 
where, on Desdemona's departure, Othello exclaims to himself. Excellent wretch! Perdition catch my soul! But I do love thee! And when I love thee not! Chaos is come again! He is supposed to mean by the last words that his love is now suspended by suspicion, whereas in fact, in his bliss, he has so totally forgotten Iago's, ha! I like not that, that the tempter has to begin all over again. The meaning is, if ever I love thee not, chaos will have come again. The feeling of insecurity is due to the excess of joy, as in the wonderful words after he rejoins Desdemona at Cyprus, too. I. 191. If it were now to die. Twere now to be most happy, for, I fear. My soul hath her content so absolute. That not another comfort like to this. Succeeds in unknown fate. If any reader boggles at the use of the present in, chaos is come again, let him observe, succeeds, in the lines just quoted, or let him look at the parallel passage in Venus and Adonis, 1019. For, he being dead, with him is beauty slain. And, beauty dead, black chaos comes again. Venus does not know that Adonis is dead when she speaks thus. Note them. Questions A.S. 2 Othello, Act 4. Scene I. 1. The first part of the scene is hard to understand, and the commentators give little help. I take the idea to be as follows. Iago sees that he must renew his attack on Othello. For, on the one hand, Othello, in spite of the resolution he had arrived at to put Desdemona to death, has taken the step, without consulting Iago, of testing her in the matter of Iago's report about the handkerchief. And, on the other hand, he now seems to have fallen into a dazed lethargic state, and must be stimulated to action. Iago's plan seems to be to remind Othello of everything that would madden him again, but to do so by professing to make light of the whole affair, and by urging Othello to put the best construction on the facts, or at any rate to acquiesce. So he says, in effect, after all, if she did kiss Cassio, that might mean little. Nay, she might even go much further without meaning any harm. Of course there is the handkerchief, ten, but then why should she not give it away? Then, affecting to renounce this hopeless attempt to disguise his true opinion, he goes on, however, I cannot, as your friend, pretend that I really regard her as innocent, the fact is, Cassio boasted to me in so many words of his conquest. Here he is interrupted by Othello's swoon. But, after all, why make such a fuss? You share the fate of most married men, and you have the advantage of not being deceived in the matter. It must have been a great pleasure to Iago to express his real cynicism thus, with the certainty that he would not be taken seriously and would advance his plot by it. At 208 to 210 he recurs to the same plan of maddening Othello by suggesting that, if he is so fond of Desdemona, he had better let the matter be, for it concerns no one but him. This speech follows Othello's exclamation, O oh, Iago, the pity of it, and this is perhaps the moment when we most of all long to destroy Iago. 2. At 216 Othello tells Iago to get him some poison, that he may kill Desdemona that night. Iago objects, do it not with poison, strangle her in her bed, even the bed she hath contaminated? Why does he object to poison? Because through the sale of the poison he himself would be involved? Possibly. Perhaps his idea was that, Desdemona being killed by Othello, and Cassio killed by Roderigo, he would then admit that he had informed Othello of the adultery, and perhaps even that he had undertaken Cassio's death. But he would declare that he never meant to fulfill his promise as to Cassio, and that he had nothing to do with Desdemona's death, he seems to be preparing for this at 285. His buying poison might wreck this plan. But it may be that his objection to poison springs merely from contempt for Othello's intellect. He can trust him to use violence, but thinks he may bungle anything that requires adroitness. 3. When the conversation breaks off here, 225, Iago has brought Othello back to the position reached at the end of the temptation scene, 3. 3. Cassio and Desdemona are to be killed, and, in addition, the time is hastened. It is to be, tonight, not, within three days. 
The constructional idea clearly is that, after the temptation scene, Othello tends to relapse and wait, which is terribly dangerous to Iago, who therefore in this scene quickens his purpose. Yet Othello relapses again. He has declared that he will not expostulate with her, for I, 217. But he cannot keep his word, and there follows the scene of accusation. Its dramatic purposes are obvious, but Othello seems to have no purpose in it. He asks no questions, or, rather, none that shows the least glimpse of doubt or hope. He is merely torturing himself. Footnotes the reader who is puzzled by this passage should refer to the conversation at the end of the thirtieth tale in the Heptameron. Note N. Two passages in the last scene of Othello. 1, v, 2. 71f. Desdemona demands that Cassio be sent for to confess the truth that she never gave him the handkerchief. Othello answers that Cassio has confessed the truth, has confessed the adultery. The dialogue goes on. Des. He will not say so. Off. No, his mouth is stopped. Honest Iago hath tain order for, t. Des. Oh. My fear interprets, what, is he dead? Off. Had all his hairs been lives, my great revenge. Had stomach for them all. Des. Alas. He is betrayed and I undone. It is a ghastly idea, but I believe Shakespeare means that, at the mention of Iago's name, Desdemona suddenly sees that he is the villain whose existence he had declared to be impossible when, an hour before. Amelia had suggested that someone had poisoned Othello's mind. But her words rouse Othello to such furious indignation, out, strumpet. Weepst thou for him to my face, that, it is too late. 2, v. 2. 286f. Off. I look down towards his feet, but that's a fable. If that thou beast a devil, I cannot kill thee, wounds Iago. Laud. Wrench his sword from him. Iago. I bleed, sir, but not killed. Are Iago's strange words meant to show his absorption of interest in himself amidst so much anguish? I think rather he is meant to be alluding to Othello's words, and saying, with a cold contemptuous smile, you see he is right, I am a devil. Note O. Othello on Desdemona's last words. I have said that the last scene of Othello, though terribly painful, contains almost nothing to diminish the admiration and love which heighten our pity for the hero, p. I said, almost, in view of the following passage, v. 2. 123 ff. Emil. Oh, who hath done this deed? Des. Nobody, I myself. Farewell. Commend me to my kind lord, oh, farewell. Dies. Off. Why, how should she be murdered? Emil. Alas, who knows? Off. You heard her say herself, it was not I. Emil. She said so, I must needs report the truth. Off. She's, like a liar, gone to burning hell. Twas I that killed her. Emil. Oh, the more angel she. And you the blacker devil. Off. She turned to folly, and she was a whore. This is a strange passage. What did Shakespeare mean us to feel? One is astonished that Othello should not be startled, nay thunderstruck, when he hears such dying words coming from the lips of an obdurate adulteress. One is shocked by the moral blindness or obliquity which takes them only as a further sign of her worthlessness. Here alone, I think, in the scene sympathy with Othello quite disappears. Did Shakespeare mean us to feel thus, and to realize how completely confused and perverted Othello's mind has become? I suppose so, and yet Othello's words continue to strike me as very strange, and also as not like Othello, especially as at this point he was not in anger, much less enraged. It has sometimes occurred to me that there is a touch of personal animus in the passage. One remembers the place in Hamlet, written but a little while before, 
where Hamlet thinks he is unwilling to kill the king at his prayers, for fear they may take him to heaven. And one remembers Shakespeare's irony, how he shows that those prayers do not go to heaven, and that the soul of this praying murderer is at that moment as murderous as ever, cp. Just as here the soul of the lying Desdemona is angelic in its lie. Is it conceivable that in both passages he was intentionally striking at conventional, religious ideas? And, in particular, that the belief that a man's everlasting fate is decided by the occupation of his last moment excited in him indignation as well as contempt? I admit that this fancy seems unshakespearean, and yet it comes back on me whenever I read this passage. The words, I suppose so, L. 3 above, gave my conclusion. But I wish to withdraw the whole note. Footnotes. He alludes to her cry, O oh falsely, falsely murdered. Note P. Did Amelia suspect Iago? I have answered no, P, and have no doubt about the matter. But at one time I was puzzled, as perhaps others have been, by a single phrase of Amelia's. It occurs in the conversation between her and Iago and Desdemona, for. 2. 130 f. I will be hanged if some eternal villain. Some busy and insinuating rogue. Some cogging, cousining slave, to get some office. Have not devised this slander, I'll be hanged else. Amelia, it may be said, knew that Cassio was the suspected man, so that she must be thinking of his office, and must mean that Iago has poisoned Othello's mind in order to prevent his reinstatement and to get the lieutenancy for himself. And, it may be said, she speaks indefinitely so that Iago alone may understand her, for Desdemona does not know that Cassio is the suspected man. Hence too, it may be said, when, at v. 2. 190, she exclaims. Villainy, villainy, villainy. I think upon, I think, I smelt, O oh villainy. I thought so then, I'll kill myself for grief. She refers in the words italicized to the occasion of the passage in 4. 2. And is reproaching herself for not having taken steps on her suspicion of Iago. I have explained in the text why I think it impossible to suppose that Amelia suspected her husband, and I do not think anyone who follows her speeches in V. 2. And who realizes that, if she did suspect him, she must have been simply pretending surprise when Othello told her that Iago was his informant, will feel any doubt. Her idea in the lines at 4. 2. 130 is, I believe, merely that someone is trying to establish a ground for asking a favor from Othello in return for information which nearly concerns him. It does not follow that, because she knew Cassio was suspected, she must have been referring to Cassio's office. She was a stupid woman, and, even if she had not been, she would not put two and two together so easily as the reader of the play. In the line. I thought so then, I'll kill myself for grief. I think she certainly refers to 4. 2, 130f and also 4. 2, 15, Stevens's idea that she is thinking of the time when she let Iago take the handkerchief is absurd. If, I'll kill myself for grief, is to be taken in close connection with the preceding words, which is not certain, she may mean that she reproaches herself for not having acted on her general suspicion. Or, less probably, that she reproaches herself for not having suspected that Iago was the rogue. With regard to my view that she failed to think of the handkerchief when she saw how angry Othello was, those who believe that she did think of it will of course also believe that she suspected Iago. But in addition to other difficulties, they will have to suppose that her astonishment, when Othello at last mentioned the handkerchief, was mere acting. And anyone who can believe this seems to me beyond argument. I regret that I cannot now discuss some suggestions made to me in regard to the subjects of notes O and P. Note Q. Iago's suspicion regarding Cassio and Emilia. The one expression of this suspicion appears in a very curious manner. Iago, soliloquizing, says, 2. I, 311. Which thing to do? If this poor trash of Venice, whom I trash. For his quick hunting, stand the putting on. I'll have our Michael Cassio on the hip. 
abuse him to the more in the rank, f. Right, garb. For I fear Cassio with my nightcap too. Make the more thank me, etc. Why, for I fear Cassio, etc. He can hardly be giving himself an additional reason for involving Cassio. The parenthesis must be explanatory of the preceding line or some part of it. I think it explains rank garb or right garb, and the meaning is, for Cassio is what I shall accuse him of being, a seducer of wives. He is returning to the thought with which the soliloquy begins, that Cassio loves her, I do well believe it. In saying this he is unconsciously trying to believe that Cassio would at any rate like to be an adulterer, so that it is not so very abominable to say that he is one. And the idea, I suspect him with Amelia, is a second and stronger attempt of the same kind. The idea probably was born and died in one moment. It is a curious example of Iago's secret subjection to morality. Note R. Reminiscences of Othello in King Lear. The following is a list, made without any special search, and doubtless incomplete, of words and phrases in King Lear which recall words and phrases in Othello, and many of which occur only in these two plays. Waterish, I, I. 261, appears only here and in O, 3. 3, 15. Fortune's Alms, I, I, 281, appears only here and in O, 3. 4, 122. Decline, seems to be used of the advance of age only in I, 2. 78 and O, 3. 3, 265. Slack in, if when they chance to slack you, 2. 4, 248, has no exact parallel in Shakespeare, but recalls, they slack their duties, O, 4. 3, 88. Allowance, equals authorization, I, 4. 228, is used thus only in KL, O, I, I. 128, and two places in Hamlet and Hen. 8. Besort, VB, I, 4. 272, does not occur elsewhere, but, Besort, SB, occurs in O, I, 3. 239 and nowhere else. Edmonds, look, sir, I bleed, too. I. 43, sounds like an echo of Iago's I bleed, sir, but not killed, O, V, 2. 288. Potential, 2. I, 78, appears only here, in O, I, 2. 13, and in the lover's complaint, which, I think, is certainly not an early poem. Poise, in, occasions of some poise, too. I, 122, is exactly like, poise, in, full of poise and difficult weight, O, 3. 3, 82, and not exactly like, poise, in the three other places where it occurs. Conjunct, used only in 2. 2, 125, Q, V. I, 12, recalls, conjunctive, used only in H, 4. 7, 14, O, I, 3. 374, F. Grime, V, B, used only in 2. 3, 9, recalls, begrime, used only in O, 3. 3, 387 and Lucrece. Unbonneted, 3. I, 14, appears only here and in O, I, 2. 23. Delicate, 3. 4, 12, 4. 3, 15, 4. 6, 188, is not a rare word with Shakespeare, he uses it about 30 times in his plays. But it is worth notice that it occurs 6 times in O. Commit, used antiar. 4, commit adultery, appears only in 3. 4, 83, but cf the famous iteration in O, 4. 2, 72 f. Stand in hard cure, 3. 6, 107, seems to have no parallel except O, 2. I, 51, stand in bold cure. Secure equals make careless, 4. I. 22, appears only here and in O, I, 3. T, 
10 and, not quite the same sense, Tim, 2. 2, 185. Albany's, perforce must wither, 4. 2, 35, recalls Othello's, it must needs wither, v, 2. 15. Deficient, 4. 6, 23, occurs only here in in o, i, 3. 63. The safer sense, 4. 6, 81, recalls, my blood begins my safer guides to rules, o, 2. 3, 205. Fit you, 4. 6, 124, is used only here, in o, 4. i, 150, and in TCV I, 67, where it has not the same significance. Lears, I have seen the day, with my good biting falchion I would have made them skip, v. 3. 276, recalls Othello's, I have seen the day, that with this little arm and this good sword, etc., v. 2. 261. The fact that more than half of the above occur in the first two acts of King Lear may possibly be significant for the farther removed Shakespeare was from the time of the composition of Othello. The less likely would be the recurrence of ideas or words used in that play. Note S. King Lear and Timon of Athens. That these two plays are near akin in character, and probably in date, is recognized by many critics now, and I will merely add here a few references to the points of resemblance mentioned in the text, p. and a few notes on other points. One. The likeness between Timon's curses and some of the speeches of Lear in his madness is, in one respect, curious. It is natural that Timon, speaking to Alcibiades and two courtesans, should inveigh in particular against sexual vices and corruption, as he does in the terrific passage for. 3, 82-166. But why should Lear refer at length, and with the same loathing, to this particular subject, for. 6. 112 to 132. It almost looks as if Shakespeare were expressing feelings which oppressed him at this period of his life. The idea may be a mere fancy, but it has seemed to me that this preoccupation, and sometimes this oppression, are traceable in other plays of the period from about 1602 to 1605 Hamlet, Measure for Measure, Troilus and Cressida, All's Well. Othello. While in earlier plays the subject is handled less, and without disgust, and in later plays, e.g. Antony and Cleopatra, The Winter's Tale, Cymbeline, it is also handled, however freely, without this air of repulsion, I omit Pericles because the authorship of the brothel scenes is doubtful. 2. For references to the lower animals, similar to those in King Lear, see especially Timon, I, I, 259, 2. 2, 180, 3. 6, 103 f, 4. i, 2, 36, 4. 3, 49 f, 177 f, 325 f, f. Surely a passage written or, at the least, rewritten by Shakespeare, 392, 426 f. I ignore the constant abuse of the dog in the conversations where Apomantis appears. 3, Further points of resemblance are noted in the text at pp. And many likenesses in word, phrase and idea might be added, of the type of the parallel, thine do comfort and not burn, Lear, 2. 4, 176, and thou son, that comfortst, burn. Timon, v. i. 134. 4, the likeness in style and versification, so far as the purely Shakespearean parts of Timon are concerned, is surely unmistakable, but some readers may like to see an example. Lear speaks here, 4. 6, 164 ff. Thou rascal beetle, hold thy bloody hand. Why dost thou lash that whore? Strip thine own back. Thou hotly lusts to use her in that kind. For which thou whipst her. The usurer hangs the cousiner. Through tattered clothes small vices do appear. Robes and furred gowns hide all. Plates sin with gold. And the strong lance of justice hurtless breaks. Armed in rags, a pygmy's straw does pierce it. 
None does offend, none, I say, none. I'll able, m. Take that of me, my friend, who have the power. To seal the accuser's lips. Get thee glass eyes. And, like a scurvy politician, seem. To see the things thou dost not. And Timon speaks here, for. 3, 1 ff. O blessed breeding sun, draw from the earth. Rotten humidity, below thy sister's orb. Infect the air. Twin brothers of one womb. Whose procreation, residence, and birth. Scarce is dividend, touch them with several fortunes. The greater scorns the lesser, not nature. To whom all sores lay siege, can bear great fortune. But by contempt of nature. Raise me this beggar, and denight that lord. The senator shall bear contempt hereditary. The beggar native honor. It is the pasture lards the rather sides. The want that makes him lean. Who dares, who dares? In purity of manhood stand upright. And say, this man's a flatterer. If one be. So are they all, for every grice of fortune. Is smoothed by that below, the learned pate. Ducks to the golden fool, all is oblique. There's nothing level in our cursed natures. But direct villainy. The reader may wish to know whether metrical tests throw any light on the chronological position of Timon, and he will find such information as I can give in. But he will bear in mind that results arrived at by applying these tests to the whole play can have little value, since it is practically certain that Shakespeare did not write the whole play. It seems to consist, one, of parts that are purely Shakespearean, the text, however, being here, as elsewhere, very corrupt, two, of parts untouched or very slightly touched by him, three, of parts where a good deal is Shakespeare's but not all, e.g. In my opinion, three. V, which I cannot believe, with Mr. Flea, to be wholly, or almost wholly, by another writer. The tests ought to be applied not only to the whole play but separately to, one, about which there is little difference of opinion. This has not been done, but Dr. Ingram has applied one test, and I have applied another, to the parts assigned by Mr. Flea to Shakespeare, c. The result is to place Timon between King Lear and Macbeth, a result which happens to coincide with that of the application of the main tests to the whole play and this result corresponds, I believe. With the general impression which we derive from the three dramas in regard to versification. Footnotes. These are I, I, two. I, two. Two, except 194 to 204, in three. Six, Timon's verse speech, four. I, four. Two, one to 28, four. Three, except 292 to 362, 399 to 413, 454 to 543, v, i, except 1 to 50, v, 2, v, 4. I am not to be taken as accepting this division throughout. Note t. Did Shakespeare shorten King Lear? I have remarked in the text, pages, on the unusual number of improbabilities, inconsistencies, etc., in King Lear. The list of examples given might easily be lengthened. Thus, a, in 4. 3, Kent refers to a letter which he confided to the gentleman for Cordelia, but in 3. I, he had given to the gentleman not a letter but a message. b, in 3. i. Again he says Cordelia will inform the gentleman who the sender of the message was, but from 4. 3. It is evident that she has done no such thing, nor does the gentleman show any curiosity on the subject. C. In the same scene, 3. I. Kent and the gentleman arrange that whichever finds the king first shall halloo to the other, but when Kent finds the king he does not halloo. These are all examples of mere carelessness as to matters which would escape attention in the theatre, matters introduced not because they are essential to the plot, but in order to give an air of verisimilitude to the conversation. And here is perhaps another instance. When Lear determines to leave Goneril and go to Reagan he says, Call my train together, I, 4. 
275. When he arrives at Gloucester's house Kent asks why he comes with so small a train, and the fool gives a reply which intimates that the rest have deserted him, too. 4. 63 ff. He and his daughters, however, seem unaware of any diminution. And, when Lear calls to horse and leaves Gloucester's house, the doors are shut against him partly on the excuse that he is attended with a desperate train, 308. Nevertheless in the storm he has no knights with him, and in 3. 7. 15 ff. We hear that some five or six and thirty of his knights are hot questrists after him. As though the real reason of his leaving Goneril with so small a train was that he had hurried away so quickly that many of his knights were unaware of his departure. This prevalence of vagueness or inconsistency is probably due to carelessness, but it may possibly be due to another cause. There are, it has sometimes struck me, slight indications that the details of the plot were originally more full and more clearly imagined than one would suppose from the play as we have it. And some of the defects to which I have drawn attention might have arisen if Shakespeare, finding his matter too bulky, had, a, omitted to write some things originally intended, and, b, after finishing his play, had reduced it by excision. And had not, in these omissions and excisions, taken sufficient pains to remove the obscurities and inconsistencies occasioned by them. Thus, to take examples of, b, Lear's, what, fifty of my followers at a clap. I, 4. 315, is very easily explained if we suppose that in the preceding conversation, as originally written, Goneril had mentioned the number. Again the curious absence of any indication why Burgundy should have the first choice of Cordelia's hand might easily be due to the same cause. So might the ignorance in which we are left as to the fate of the fool, and several more of the defects noticed in the text. To illustrate the other point, a, that Shakespeare may have omitted to write some things which he had originally intended, the play would obviously gain something if it appeared that, at a time shortly before that of the action. Gloucester had encouraged the king in his idea of dividing the kingdom, while Kent had tried to dissuade him. And there are one or two passages which suggest that this is what Shakespeare imagined. If it were so, there would be additional point in the fool's reference to the lord who counseled Lear to give away his land, I, 4. 154, and in Gloucester's Reflection, 3. 4, 168. His daughters seek his death, ah, that good Kent. He said it would be thus. Said, of course, not to the king but to Gloucester and perhaps others of the council. Thus too the plots would be still more closely joined. Then also we should at once understand the opening of the play. To Kent's words, I thought the king had more affected the Duke of Albany than Cornwall, Gloucester answers, it did always seem so to us. Who are the us from whom Kent is excluded? I do not know, for there is no sign that Kent has been absent. But if Kent, in consequence of his opposition, had fallen out of favor and absented himself from the council, it would be clear. So, besides, would be the strange suddenness with which, after Gloucester's answer, Kent changes the subject. He would be avoiding, in presence of Gloucester's son, any further reference to a subject on which he and Gloucester had differed. That Kent, I may add, had already the strongest opinion about Goneril and Reagan is clear from his extremely bold words, I. I. 165. Kill thy physician, and the fee bestow. Upon thy foul disease. Did Lear remember this phrase when he called Goneril, a disease that's in my flesh, too? 4. 225. Again, the observant reader may have noticed that Goneril is not only represented as the fiercer and more determined of the two sisters but also strikes one as the more sensual. And with this may be connected one or two somewhat curious points, Kent's comparison of Goneril to the figure of vanity in the morality plays, too. 2. 38. The fool's apparently quite irrelevant remark, though his remarks are scarcely ever so, for there was never yet fair woman but she made mouths in a glass, 3. 2, 35. Kent's reference to Oswald, long before there is any sign of Goneril's intrigue with Edmund, as, one that would be a bawd in way of good service, 2. 2, 20, and Edgar's words to the corpse of Oswald, 
4. 6. 257, also spoken before he knew anything of the intrigue with Edmund. I know thee well, a serviceable villain. As duteous to the vices of thy mistress. As badness would desire. Perhaps Shakespeare had conceived Goneril as a woman who before her marriage had shown signs of sensual vice. But the distinct indications of this idea were crowded out of his exposition when he came to write it, or, being inserted, were afterwards excised. I will not go on to hint that Edgar had Oswald in his mind when, 3. 4. 87. He described the serving man who served the lust of his mistress' heart, and did the act of darkness with her, and still less that Lear can have had Goneril in his mind in the declamation against lechery referred to him. I do not mean to imply, by writing this note, that I believe in the hypotheses suggested in it. On the contrary I think it more probable that the defects referred to arose from carelessness and other causes. But this is not, to me, certain. And the reader who rejects the hypotheses may be glad to have his attention called to the points which suggested them. Footnotes It has been suggested that his means Gloucesters, but him all through the speech evidently means Lear. Note you. Movements of the Dramatis Personae in Act Two. Of King Lear. I have referred in the text to the obscurity of the play on this subject, and I will set out the movements here. When Lear is ill treated by Goneril, his first thought is to seek refuge with Regan, I. 4. 274f, 327f. Goneril, accordingly, who had foreseen this, and, even before the quarrel, had determined to write to Regan, I. 3. 25, now sends Oswald off to her, telling her not to receive Lear and his hundred knights, I. 4. 354f. In consequence of this letter Regan and Cornwall immediately leave their home and ride by night to Gloucester's house, sending word on that they are coming, too. I. 1 ff. 81, 120 ff. Lear, on his part, just before leaving Goneril's house, sends Kent with a letter to Regan, and tells him to be quick, or Lear will be there before him. And we find that Kent reaches Regan and delivers his letter before Oswald, Goneril's messenger. Both the messengers are taken on by Cornwall and Regan to Gloucester's house. In 2. 4, Lear arrives at Gloucester's house, having, it would seem, failed to find Regan at her own home. And, later, Goneril arrives at Gloucester's house, in accordance with an intimation which she had sent in her letter to Regan, too. 4. 186f. Thus all the principal persons except Cordelia and Albany are brought together. And the crises of the double action, the expulsion of Lear and the blinding and expulsion of Gloucester, are reached in Act 3. And this is what was required. But it needs the closest attention to follow these movements. And, apart from this, difficulties remain. 1. Goneril, in dispatching Oswald with the letter to Regan, tells him to hasten his return, I. 4. 363, Lear again is surprised to find that his messenger has not been sent back, too. 4. 1 f, 36 f. Yet apparently both Goneril and Lear themselves start at once, so that their messengers could not return in time. It may be said that they expected to meet them coming back, but there is no indication of this in the text. 2. Lear, in dispatching Kent, says, I, V, 1. Go you before to Gloucester with these letters. Acquaint my daughter no further with anything you know than comes from her demand out of the letter. This would seem to imply that Lear knew that Regan and Cornwall were at Gloucester's house, and meant either to go there, so couple, or to summon her back to her own home to receive him. Yet this is clearly not so, for Kent goes straight to Regan's house, too. I. 124, 2. 4, 1, 27 ff, 114 ff. Hence it is generally supposed that by Gloucester, in the passage just quoted, Lear means not the Earl but the place. That Regan's home was there, and that Gloucester's castle was somewhere not very far off. This is to some extent confirmed by the fact that Cornwall is the arch or patron of Gloucester, too. I. 60 f, 112 ff. 
But Gloucester's home or house must not be imagined quite close to Cornwall's, for it takes a night to ride from the one to the other, and Gloucester's house is in the middle of a solitary heath with scarce a bush for many miles about, too. 4. 304. The plural, these letters in the passage quoted need give no trouble, for the plural is often used by Shakespeare for a single letter. And the natural conjecture that Lear sent one letter to Reagan and another to Gloucester is not confirmed by anything in the text. The only difficulty is that, as Koppel points out, Gloucester is nowhere else used in the play for the place, except in the phrase, Earl of Gloucester or My Lord of Gloucester. And, what is more important, that it would unquestionably be taken by the audience to stand in this passage for the Earl, especially as there has been no previous indication that Cornwall lived at Gloucester. One can only suppose that Shakespeare forgot that he had given no such indication, and so wrote what was sure to be misunderstood, unless we suppose that Gloucester is a mere slip of the pen, or even a misprint, for Reagan. But, apart from other considerations, Lear would hardly have spoken to a servant of Reagan, and, if he had, the next words would have run, Acquaint her, not, Acquaint my daughter. Note V. Suspected Interpolations in King Lear there are three passages in King Lear which have been held to be additions made by the players. The first consists of the two lines of indecent doggerel spoken by the fool at the end of Act I. The second, of the fool's prophecy in rhyme at the end of three. Two, the third, of Edgar's soliloquy at the end of three. Six. It is suspicious, one, that all three passages occur at the ends of scenes, the place where an addition is most easily made. And, two, that in each case the speaker remains behind alone to utter the words after the other persons have gone off. I postpone discussion of the several passages until I have called attention to the fact that, if these passages are genuine, the number of scenes which end with a soliloquy is larger in King Lear than in any other undoubted tragedy. Thus, taking the tragedies in their probable chronological order, and ignoring the very short scenes into which a battle is sometimes divided, I find that there are in Romeo and Juliet for such scenes, in Julius Caesar II, in Hamlet VI, in Othello IV, in King Lear VII, in Macbeth II, in Antony and Cleopatra III, in Coriolanus I. The difference between King Lear and the plays that come nearest to it is really much greater than it appears from this list, for in Hamlet four of the six soliloquies, and in Othello three of the four, are long speeches. While most of those in King Lear are quite short. Of course I do not attach any great importance to the fact just noticed, but it should not be left entirely out of account in forming an opinion as to the genuineness of the three doubted passages. A. The first of these, I, V. 54 to 5, I decidedly believe to be spurious. 1. The scene ends quite in Shakespeare's manner without it. 2. It does not seem likely that at the end of the scene Shakespeare would have introduced anything violently incongruous with the immediately preceding words. Oh, let me not be mad, not mad, sweet heaven. Keep me in temper, I would not be mad. 3. Even if he had done so, it is very unlikely that the incongruous words would have been grossly indecent. For, even if they had been, surely they would not have been irrelevantly indecent and evidently addressed to the audience, two faults which are not in Shakespeare's way. 5. The lines are doggerel. Doggerel is not uncommon in the earliest plays. There are a few lines even in The Merchant of Venice, a line and a half, perhaps, in As You Like It, but I do not think it occurs later, not even where, in an early play, it would certainly have been found, e.g. In the mouth of the clown in All's Well. The best that can be said for these lines is that they appear in the quartos, i.e. in reports, however vile, of the play as performed within two or three years of its composition. b. I believe, almost as decidedly, that the second passage, 3. 2. 79 ff, is spurious. 1. The scene ends characteristically without the lines. 2. They are addressed directly to the audience. 3. They destroy the pathetic and beautiful effect of the immediately preceding words of the fool, and also of Lear's solicitude for him. 4. 
They involve the absurdity that the shivering timid fool would allow his master and protector, Lear and Kent, to go away into the storm and darkness, leaving him alone. 5. It is also somewhat against them that they do not appear in the quartos. At the same time I do not think one would hesitate to accept them if they occurred at any natural place within the dialogue. C. On the other hand I see no sufficient reason for doubting the genuineness of Edgar's soliloquy at the end of 3. 6. 1. Those who doubt it appear not to perceive that some words of soliloquy are wanted, for it is evidently intended that, when Kent and Gloucester bear the king away, they should leave the bedlam behind. Naturally they do so. He is only accidentally connected with the king, he was taken to shelter with him merely to gratify his whim, and as the king is now asleep there is no occasion to retain the bedlam. Kent, we know, shrank from him, shunned, his, abhorred society, v. 3. 210, so he is left to return to the hovel where he was first found. When the others depart, then, he must be left behind, and surely would not go off without a word. 2. If his speech is spurious, therefore, it has been substituted for some genuine speech, and surely that is a supposition not to be entertained except under compulsion. 3. There is no such compulsion in the speech. It is not very good, no doubt. But the use of rhymed and somewhat antithetic lines in a gnomic passage is quite in Shakespeare's manner, more in his manner than, for example, the rhymed passages in I, I, 183-190, 257 to 269, 281 to 4, which nobody doubts. Quite like many places in All's Well, or the concluding lines of King Lear itself. 4. The lines are in spirit of one kind with Edgar's fine lines at the beginning of Act 4. 5. Some of them, as Delius observes, emphasize the parallelism between the stories of Lear and Gloucester. 6. The fact that the folio omits the lines is, of course, nothing against them. Footnotes. I ignore them partly because they are not significant for the present purpose, but mainly because it is impossible to accept the division of battle scenes in our modern texts. While to depart from it is to introduce intolerable inconvenience in reference. The only proper plan in Elizabethan drama is to consider a scene ended as soon as no person is left on the stage, and to pay no regard to the question of locality. A question theatrically insignificant and undetermined in most scenes of an Elizabethan play, in consequence of the absence of movable scenery. In dealing with battles the modern editors seem to have gone on the principle, which they could not possibly apply generally, that, so long as the place is not changed, you have only one scene. Hence in Macbeth, Act V. They have included in their scene seven. Three distinct scenes, yet in Antony and Cleopatra, Act Three. Following the right division for a wrong reason, they have two scenes, eight and nine, each less than four lines long. One of these, V, I, is not marked as such, but it is evident that the last line and a half form a soliloquy of one remaining character, just as much as some of the soliloquies marked as such in other plays. According to modern editions, eight, act two, scene two. Being an instance. But it is quite ridiculous to reckon as three scenes what are marked as scenes two, three, four. Kent is on the lower stage the whole time, Edgar in the so called scene three. Being on the upper stage or balcony. The editors were misled by their ignorance of the stage arrangements. Perhaps three, four v, three. Is perhaps an instance, though not so marked. Note W. The staging of the scene of Lear's reunion with Cordelia. As Koppel has shown, the usual modern stage directions for this scene, 4. 7, are utterly wrong and do what they can to defeat the poet's purpose. It is evident from the text that the scene shows the first meeting of Cordelia and Kent, and first meeting of Cordelia and Lear, since they parted in I, I. Kent and Cordelia indeed are doubtless supposed to have exchanged a few words before they come on the stage, but Cordelia has not seen her father at all until the moment before she begins, line 26, O oh my dear father. Hence the tone of the first part of the scene, that between Cordelia and Kent, is kept low, in order that the latter part, between Cordelia and Lear, may have its full effect. 
The modern stage direction at the beginning of the scene, as found, for example, in the Cambridge and Globe editions, is as follows. Scene 7. A tent in the French camp. Lear on a bed asleep, soft music playing, gentlemen, and others attending. Enter Cordelia, Kent, and Doctor. At line 25, where the doctor says, Please you, draw near, Cordelia is supposed to approach the bed, which is imagined by some editors visible throughout at the back of the stage, by others as behind a curtain at the back. This curtain being drawn open at line 25. Now, to pass by the fact that these arrangements are in flat contradiction with the stage directions of the quartos and the folio, consider their effect upon the scene. In the first place, the reader at once assumes that Cordelia has already seen her father, for otherwise it is inconceivable that she would quietly talk with Kent while he was within a few yards of her. The edge of the later passage where she addresses him is therefore blunted. In the second place, through Lear's presence the reader's interest in Lear in his meeting with Cordelia is at once excited so strongly that he hardly attends at all to the conversation of Cordelia and Kent, and so this effect is blunted too. Thirdly, at line 57, where Cordelia says, Oh, look upon me, sir. And hold your hands in benediction o'er me. No, sir, you must not kneel. The poor old king must be supposed either to try to get out of bed, or actually to do so, or to kneel, or to try to kneel, on the bed. Fourthly, consider what happens at line 81. Doctor. Desire him to go in. Trouble him no more. Till further settling. Sir. Wilt please your highness walk. Lear. You must bear with me. Pray you now, forget and forgive, I am old and foolish. Exeunt all but Kent and gentlemen. If Lear is in a tent containing his bed, why in the world, when the doctor thinks he can bear no more emotion, is he made to walk out of the tent? A pretty doctor. But turn now to the original texts. Of course they say nothing about the place. The stage direction at the beginning runs, in the quartos, enter Cordelia, Kent, and doctor, in the folio, enter Cordelia, Kent, and gentleman. They differ about the gentleman and the doctor, and the folio later wrongly gives to the gentleman the doctor's speeches as well as his own. This is a minor matter. But they agree in making no mention of Lear. He is not on the stage at all. Thus Cordelia, and the reader, can give their whole attention to Kent. Her conversation with Kent finished, she turns, line 12, to the doctor and asks, how does the king? The doctor tells her that Lear is still asleep, and asks leave to wake him. Cordelia assents and asks if he is arrayed, which does not mean whether he has a nightgown on, but whether they have taken away his crown of furrow weeds, and tended him duly after his mad wanderings in the fields. The gentleman says that in his sleep fresh garments, not a nightgown, have been put on him. The doctor then asks Cordelia to be present when her father is waked. She assents, and the doctor says, Please you, draw near. Louder the music there. The next words are Cordelia's, Oh my dear father. What has happened? At the words, Is he arrayed, according to the folio, enter Lear in a chair carried by servants. The moment of this entrance, as so often in the original editions, is doubtless too soon. It should probably come at the words, Please you, draw near, which may, as Koppel suggests, be addressed to the bearers. But that the stage direction is otherwise right there cannot be a doubt, and that the quartos omitted is no argument against it, seeing that, according to their directions, Lear never enters at all. This arrangement, one, allows Kent his proper place in the scene, two, makes it clear that Cordelia has not seen her father before, three, makes her first sight of him a theatrical crisis in the best sense, for, makes it quite natural that he should kneel. 5. Makes it obvious why he should leave the stage again when he shows signs of exhaustion, and, 6. Is the only arrangement which has the slightest authority, for, Lear on a bed asleep, was never heard of till Capel proposed it. The ruinous change of the staging was probably suggested by the version of that unhappy Tate. Of course the chair arrangement is primitive, but the Elizabethans did not care about such things. What they cared for was dramatic effect. 
Footnotes. There are exceptions, e.g., in the editions of Delius and Mr. W. J. Craig. And it is possible that, as Koppel suggests, the doctor should properly enter at this point. For if Kent, as he says, wishes to remain unknown, it seems strange that he and Cordelia should talk as they do before a third person. This change however is not necessary, for the doctor might naturally stand out of hearing till he was addressed. And it is better not to go against the stage direction without necessity. Note X. The Battle in King Lear. I found my impression of the extraordinary ineffectiveness of this battle, p. Confirmed by a paper of James Spedding, New Shakespeare Society Transactions, 1877, or Furness's King Lear, page 312f. But his opinion that this is the one technical defect in King Lear seems certainly incorrect, and his view that this defect is not due to Shakespeare himself will not, I think, bear scrutiny. To make Spedding's view quite clear I may remind the reader that in the preceding scene the two British armies, that of Edmund and Reagan, and that of Albany and Goneril, have entered with drum and colours, and have departed. Scene 2. Is as follows, Globe. Scene 2. Dot, a field between the two camps. Alarum within. Enter, with drum and colours, Lear, Cordelia, and soldiers, over the stage, and exeunt. Enter Edgar and Gloucester. E.D.G. Here, Father, take the shadow of this tree. For your good host, pray that the right may thrive. If ever I return to you again, I'll bring you comfort. Glow. Grace go with you, sir. Exit Edgar. Alarum and retreat within. Re-enter Edgar. E.D.G. Away, old man. Give me thy hand, away. King Lear hath lost, he and his daughter tame. Give me thy hand, come on. Glow. No farther, sir, a man may rot even here. E.D.G. What, in ill thoughts again? Men must endure. They're going hence, even as they're coming hither. Ripeness is all, come on. Glow. And that's true too, exeunt. The battle, it will be seen, is represented only by military music within the tiring house, which formed the back of the stage. The scene, says Spedding, does not change. But, alarums are heard, and afterwards of retreat, and on the same field over which that great army has this moment passed, fresh and full of hope, reappears, with tidings that all is lost. The same man who last left the stage to follow and fight in it. That Shakespeare meant the scene to stand thus, no one who has the true faith will believe. Spedding's suggestion is that things are here run together which Shakespeare meant to keep apart. Shakespeare, he thinks, continued Act 4. To the, exit Edgar, after L, 4 of the above passage. Thus, just before the close of the act, the two British armies and the French army had passed across the stage, and the interest of the audience in the battle about to be fought was raised to a high pitch. Then, after a short interval, Act V. Opened with the noise of battle in the distance, followed by the entrance of Edgar to announce the defeat of Cordelia's army. The battle, thus, though not fought on the stage, was shown and felt to be an event of the greatest importance. Apart from the main objection of the entire want of evidence of so great a change having been made, there are other objections to this idea and to the reasoning on which it is based. 1. The pause at the end of the present fourth act is far from faulty, as Spedding alleges it to be, that act ends with the most melting scene Shakespeare ever wrote. And a pause after it, and before the business of the battle, was perfectly right. 2. The fourth act is already much longer than the fifth, about fourteen columns of the Globe edition against about eight and a half, and Spedding's change would give the fourth nearly sixteen columns, and the fifth less than seven. Three, Spedding's proposal requires a much greater alteration in the existing text than he supposed. It does not simply shift the division of the two acts, it requires the disappearance and re-entrance of the blind Gloucester. Gloucester, as the text stands, is alone on the stage while the battle is being fought at a distance, and the reference to the tree shows that he was on the main or lower stage. The main stage had no front curtain, 
and therefore, if Act 4 is to end where Spedding wished it to end, Gloucester must go off unaided at its close, and come on again unaided for Act V. And this means that the whole arrangement of the present Act versus SC, too, must be changed. If Spedding had been aware of this it is not likely that he would have broached his theory. It is curious that he does not allude to the one circumstance which throws some little suspicion on the existing text. I mean the contradiction between Edgar's statement that, if ever he returns to his father again, he will bring him comfort, and the fact that immediately afterwards he returns to bring him discomfort. It is possible to explain this psychologically, of course, but the passage is not one in which we should expect psychological subtlety. Footnotes Where did Spedding find this? I find no trace of it, and surely Edgar would not have risked his life in the battle, when he had, in case of defeat, to appear and fight Edmund. He does not appear armed, according to the folio, till v. 3. 117. Spedding supposed that there was a front curtain, and this idea, coming down from Malone and Collier, is still found in English works of authority. But it may be stated without hesitation that there is no positive evidence at all for the existence of such a curtain, and abundant evidence against it. Note why. Some difficult passages in King Lear. The following are notes on some passages where I have not been able to accept any of the current interpretations, or on which I wish to express an opinion or represent a little-known view. 1. Kent's soliloquy at the end of 2. 2. a. In this speech the application of the words, nothing, almost sees miracles but misery seems not to have been understood. The misery is surely not that of Kent but that of Lear, who has come out of heaven's benediction to the warm sun, i.e. to misery. This, says Kent, is just the situation where something like miraculous help may be looked for, and he finds the sign of it in the fact that a letter from Cordelia has just reached him. For his course since his banishment has been so obscured that it is only by the rarest good fortune, something like a miracle, that Cordelia has got intelligence of it. We may suppose that this intelligence came from one of Albany's or Cornwall's servants, some of whom are, he says, 3. I, 23. To France the spies and speculations. Intelligent of our state. B, the words, and shall find time, etc. Have been much discussed. Some have thought that they are detached phrases from the letter which Kent is reading but Kent has just implied by his address to the son that he has no light to read the letter by. It has also been suggested that the Anacleuthon is meant to represent Kent's sleepiness, which prevents him from finishing the sentence, and induces him to dismiss his thoughts and yield to his drowsiness. But I remember nothing like this elsewhere in Shakespeare, and it seems much more probable that the passage is corrupt, perhaps from the loss of a line containing words like, to rescue us before, from this enormous state, with, state, cf. Our state, in the lines quoted above. When we reach three. I, we find that Kent has now read the letter, he knows that a force is coming from France and indeed has already, secret feet, in some of the harbors. So he sends the gentleman to Dover. Two. The fool's song in two. Four. At two. Four. 62 Kent asks why the king comes with so small a train. The fool answers, in effect, that most of his followers have deserted him because they see that his fortunes are sinking. He proceeds to advise Kent ironically to follow their example, though he confesses he does not intend to follow it himself. Let go thy hold when a great will runs down a hill, lest it break thy neck with following it, but the great one that goes up the hill, let him draw thee after. When a wise man gives thee better counsel, give me mine again, would have none but knaves follow it, since a fool gives it. That sir which serves and seeks for gain. And follows but for form. Will pack when it begins to rain. And leave thee in the storm. But I will tarry, the fool will stay. And let the wise man fly. The knave turns fool that runs away. The fool no knave, purdy. The last two lines have caused difficulty. Johnson wanted to read. The fool turns knave that runs away. The knave no fool, purdy. I.e. 
If I ran away, I should prove myself to be a knave and a wise man, but, being a fool, I stay, as no knave or wise man would. Those who rightly defend the existing reading misunderstand it, I think. Shakespeare is not pointing out, in, The Knave Turns Fool That Runs Away, that the wise knave who runs away is really a fool with a circumbendibus, moral miscalculator as well as moral coward. The fool is referring to his own words, I would have none but knaves follow, my advice to desert the king, since a fool gives it, and the last two lines of his song mean, the knave who runs away follows the advice given by a fool. But I, the fool, shall not follow my own advice by turning knave. For the ideas compare the striking passage in Timon, I, I, 64 ff. 3. Decline your head. At 4. 2. 18 Goneril, dismissing Edmund in the presence of Oswald, says. This trusty servant. Shall pass between us, ere long you are like to hear. If you dare venture in your own behalf. A mistress's command. Wear this, spare speech. Decline your head, this kiss, if it durst speak. Would stretch thy spirits up into the air. I copy Furness's note on, decline, Stevens thinks that Goneril bids Edmund decline his head that she might, while giving him a kiss, appear to Oswald merely to be whispering to him. But this, Wright says, is giving Goneril credit for too much delicacy, and Oswald was a serviceable villain. Delius suggests that perhaps she wishes to put a chain around his neck. Surely, decline your head, is connected, not with where this, whatever, this, may be, but with this kiss, etc. Edmund is a good deal taller than Goneril, and must stoop to be kissed. 4. Self-covered. At 4. 2. 59 Albany, horrified at the passions of anger, hate, and contempt expressed in his wife's face, breaks out. See thyself, devil. Proper deformity seems not in the fiend. So horrid as in woman. Gone. O vain fool. Alb. Thou changed and self-covered thing, for shame. Be monster not thy feature. Work my fitness. To let these hands obey my blood. They are apt enough to dislocate and tear. Thy flesh and bones, how thou art a fiend. A woman's shape doth shield thee. The passage has been much discussed, mainly because of the strange expression, self-covered, for which of course emendations have been proposed. The general meaning is clear. Albany tells his wife that she is a devil in a woman's shape, and warns her not to cast off that shape by bemonstering her feature, appearance, since it is this shape alone that protects her from his wrath. Almost all commentators go astray because they imagine that, in the words, thou changed and self-covered thing, Albany is speaking to Goneril as a woman who has been changed into a fiend. Really he is addressing her as a fiend which has changed its own shape and assumed that of a woman. And I suggest that, self-covered means either, which hast covered or concealed thyself, or, whose self is covered, so Craig in Arden edition, not, what of course it ought to mean, which hast been covered by thyself. Possibly the last lines of this passage, which does not appear in the folios, should be arranged thus. To let these hands obey my blood, they're apt enough. To dislocate and tear thy flesh and bones. How if thou art a fiend? A woman's shape. Doth shield thee. Gone. Mary, your manhood now. Alb. What news? 5. The stage directions at V.I. 37, 39. In V.I. there first enter Edmund, Regan, and their army or soldiers, then, at line 18, Albany, Goneril, and their army or soldiers. Edmund and Albany speak very stiffly to one another, and Goneril bids them defer their private quarrels and attend to business. Then follows this passage, according to the modern texts. Alb. Let's then determine. With the Ancient of War on our proceedings. EDM. I shall attend you presently at your tent. Reg. Sister, you'll go with us. Gone. No. Reg. Tis most convenient. Pray you, go with us. 
gone. Aside, oh, ho, I know the riddle dot, I will go. As they are going out, enter Edgar disguised. EDG. If e'er your grace had speech with man so poor. Hear me one word. Alb. I'll overtake you. Speak. Exeunt all but Albany and Edgar. It would appear from this that all the leading persons are to go to a council of war with the ancient, plural, in Albany's tent, and they are going out, followed by their armies, when Edgar comes in. Why in the world, then, should Goneril propose, as she apparently does, to absent herself from the council, and why, still more, should Reagan object to her doing so? This is a question which always perplexed me, and I could not believe in the only answers I ever found suggested, viz. That Reagan wanted to keep Edmund and Goneril together in order that she might observe them, moberly, quoted in furnace, or that she could not bear to lose sight of Goneril. For fear Goneril should effect a meeting with Edmund after the council, Delius, if I understand him. But I find in Koppel what seems to be the solution, for Besserungsverschlage, page 127f. He points out that the modern stage directions are wrong. For the modern direction as they are going out, enter Edgar disguised, the FF. Read, exeunt both the armies. Enter Edgar. For exeunt all but Albany and Edgar the FF, have nothing, but Q1 has exeunt after word. For the first direction couple would read, exeunt Reagan, Goneril, gentlemen, and soldiers, for the second he would read, after overtake you, exit Edmund. This makes all clear. Albany proposes a council of war. Edmund assents, and says he will come at once to Albany's tent for that purpose. The council will consist of Albany, Edmund, and the Ancient of War. Regan, accordingly, is going away with her soldiers. But she observes that Goneril shows no sign of moving with her soldiers, and she at once suspects that Goneril means to attend the council in order to be with Edmund. Full of jealousy, she invites Goneril to go with her. Goneril refuses, but then, seeing Reagan's motive, contemptuously and ironically consents, I doubt if oh ho, I know the riddle, should be, aside, as in modern editions, following Capel. Accordingly the two sisters go out, followed by their soldiers, and Edmund and Albany are just going out, in a different direction, to Albany's tent when Edgar enters. His words cause Albany to stay. Albany says to Edmund, as Edmund leaves, I'll overtake you, and then, turning to Edgar, bids him, speak. 6, v, 3. 151 ff. When Edmund falls in combat with the disguised Edgar, Albany produces the letter from Goneril to Edmund, which Edgar had found in Oswald's pocket and had handed over to Albany. This letter suggested to Edmund the murder of Albany. The passage in the Globe edition is as follows. Gone. This is practice, Gloucester. By the law of arms thou wast not bound to answer. An unknown opposite, thou art not vanquished. But cousined and beguiled. Alb. Shut your mouth, dame. Or with this paper shall I stop it, hold, sir. Thou worse than any name, read thy own evil. No tearing, lady, I perceive you know it. Gives the letter to Edmund. Gone. Say, if I do, the laws are mine, not thine. Who can arraign me for it? Alb. Most monstrous. Oh. Knowst thou this paper? Gone. Ask me not what I know. Exit. Alb. Go after her, she's desperate, govern her. EDM. What you have charged me with, that have I done. And more, much more, the time will bring it out. Tis past, and so am I. But what art thou? That hast this fortune on me. The first of the stage directions is not in the QQ or FF. It was inserted by Johnson. The second, exit, is both in the QQ and in the FF, but the latter place it after the words, arraign me for it. And they give the words, ask me not what I know, to Edmund, not to Goneril, as in the QQ. Followed by the globe. I will not go into the various views of these lines, 
but will simply say what seems to me most probable. It does not matter much where precisely Goneril's exit comes. But I believe the folios are right in giving the words, ask me not what I know, to Edmund. It has been pointed out by night that the question, knowst thou this paper? Cannot very well be addressed to Goneril, for Albany has already said to her, I perceive you know it. It is possible to get over this difficulty by saying that Albany wants her confession, but there is another fact which seems to have passed unnoticed. When Albany is undoubtedly speaking to his wife, he uses the plural pronoun, shut your mouth, dame, no tearing, lady, I perceive you know it. When then he asks, knowst thou this paper, he is probably not speaking to her. I should take the passage thus. At, hold, sir, omitted in QQ. Albany holds the letter out towards Edmund for him to see, or possibly gives it to him. The next line, with its thou, is addressed to Edmund, whose reciprocal vows are mentioned in the letter. Goneril snatches at it to tear it up, and Albany, who does not know whether Edmund ever saw the letter or not, says to her, I perceive you know it, the you being emphatic, her very wish to tear it showed she knew what was in it. She practically admits her knowledge, defies him, and goes out to kill herself. He exclaims in horror at her, and, turning again to Edmund, asks if he knows it. Edmund, who of course does not know it, refuses to answer, like Iago, not, like Iago, out of defiance, but from chivalry towards Goneril. And, having refused to answer this charge, he goes on to admit the charges brought against himself previously by Albany, 82F, and Edgar, 130F. I should explain the change from you to thou in his speech by supposing that at first he is speaking to Albany and Edgar together. 7, v. 3. 278. Lear, looking at Kent, asks. Who are you? Mine eyes are not oh, the best, I'll tell you straight. Kent. If fortune brag of two she loved and hated, qq, or. One of them we behold. Kent is not answering Lear, nor is he speaking of himself. He is speaking of Lear. The best interpretation is probably that of Malone, according to which Kent means, we see the man most hated by fortune, whoever may be the man she has loved best, and perhaps it is supported by the variation of the text in the QQ. Though their texts are so bad in this scene that their support is worth little. But it occurs to me as possible that the meaning is rather, did fortune ever show the extremes both of her love and of her hatred to any other man as she has shown them to this man? 8. The last lines. Alb. Bear them from hence. Our present business. Is general woe. To Kent and Edgar, friends of my soul, you twain. Rule in this realm, and the gored state sustain. Kent. I have a journey, sir, shortly to go. My master calls me, I must not say no. Alb. The weight of this sad time we must obey. Speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. The oldest hath borne most, we that are young. Shall never see so much, nor live so long. So the globe. The stage direction, right, of course, is Johnson's. The last four lines are given by the FF, to Edgar, by the QQ, to Albany. The QQ, read, have borne most. To whom ought the last four lines to be given, and what do they mean? It is proper that the principal person should speak last, and this is in favor of Albany. But in this scene at any rate the FF, which give the speech to Edgar, have the better text, though FF, 2, 3, 4, make Kent die after his two lines. Kent has answered Albany, but Edgar has not, and the lines seem to be rather more appropriate to Edgar. For the gentle reproof of Kent's despondency, if this phrase of Hallowell's is right, is like Edgar. And, although we have no reason to suppose that Albany was not young, there is nothing to prove his youth. As to the meaning of the last two lines, a poor conclusion to such a play, I should suppose that, the oldest, is not Lear, but, the oldest of us, viz. Kent, the one survivor of the old generation, and this is the more probable if there is a reference to him in the preceding lines. 
The last words seem to mean, we that are young shall never see so much and yet live so long, i.e. If we suffer so much, we shall not bear it as he has. If the QQ, have, is right, the reference is to Lear, Gloucester and Kent. Footnotes. The, beacon, which he bids approach is not the moon, as Pope supposed. The moon was up and shining some time ago, too. 2. 35, and lines 1 and 141 to 2 imply that not much of the night is left. Hold, can mean, take, but the word, this, in line 160, knowst thou this paper. Favors the idea that the paper is still in Albany's hand. Note C. Suspected interpolations in Macbeth. I have assumed in the text that almost the whole of Macbeth is genuine. And, to avoid the repetition of arguments to be found in other books, I shall leave this opinion unsupported. But among the passages that have been questioned or rejected there are two which seem to me open to serious doubt. They are those in which Hecate appears, viz. The whole of three. V, and four. I, 39-43. These passages have been suspected, one, because they contain stage directions for two songs which have been found in Middleton's Witch. 2. Because they can be excised without leaving the least trace of their excision, and, 3. Because they contain lines incongruous with the spirit and atmosphere of the rest of the witch scenes, e.g. 3. V. 10 F. All you have done. Hath been but for a wayward son. Spiteful and wrathful, who, as others do. Loves for his own ends, not for you. And four. I, forty one, two. And now about the cauldron sing. Like elves and fairies in a ring. The idea of sexual relation in the first passage, and the trivial daintiness of the second, with which cf three. V, thirty four. Hark. I am called. My little spirit, C. Sits in a foggy cloud and stays for me. Suit Middleton's witches quite well, but Shakespeare's not at all. And it is difficult to believe that, if Shakespeare had meant to introduce a personage supreme over the witches, he would have made her so unimpressive as this Hecate. It may be added that the original stage direction at 4. I. 39, Enter Hecat and the other three witches, is suspicious. I doubt if the second and third of these arguments, taken alone, would justify a very serious suspicion of interpolation. But the fact, mentioned under, one, that the play has here been meddled with, trebles their weight. And it gives some weight to the further fact that these passages resemble one another, and differ from the bulk of the other which passages, in being iambic in rhythm. It must, however, be remembered that, supposing Shakespeare did mean to introduce Hecate, he might naturally use a special rhythm for the parts where she appeared. The same rhythm appears in a third passage which has been doubted, for I, 125 to 132. But this is not quite on a level with the other two, for, one, though it is possible to suppose the witches, as well as the apparitions, to vanish at 124, and Macbeth's speech to run straight on to 133, the cut is not so clean as in the other cases. Two, it is not at all clear that Hecate, the most suspicious element, is supposed to be present. The original stage direction at 133 is merely the witch's dance, and vanish. And even if Hecate had been present before, she might have vanished at 43, as Dice makes her do. Footnotes E.g. Mr. Chambers's excellent little edition in the Warwick series. Note AA Has Macbeth been abridged? Macbeth is a very short play, the shortest of all Shakespeare's except the Comedy of Errors. It contains only 1993 lines, while King Lear contains 3298, Othello 3324, and Hamlet 3924. The next shortest of the tragedies is Julius Caesar, which has 2440 lines. The figures are Mr. Fleas. I may remark that for our present purpose we want the number of the lines in the first folio, not those in modern composite texts. Is there any reason to think that the play has been shortened? I will briefly consider this question, 
so far as it can be considered apart from the wider one whether Shakespeare's play was rehandled by Middleton or someone else. That the play, as we have it, is slightly shorter than the play Shakespeare wrote seems not improbable. 1. We have no quarto of Macbeth, and generally, where we have a quarto or quartos of a play, we find them longer than the folio text. 2. There are perhaps a few signs of omission in our text, over and above the plentiful signs of corruption. I will give one example, I, 4. 33-43. Macbeth and Banquo, returning from their victories, enter the presence of Duncan, 14, who receives them with compliments and thanks, which they acknowledge. He then speaks as follows. My plenteous joys. Wanton in fullness, seek to hide themselves. In drops of sorrow. Sons, kinsmen, thanes. And you whose places are the nearest, no. We will establish our estate upon. Our eldest, Malcolm, whom we name hereafter. The Prince of Cumberland. Which honor must. Not unaccompanied invest him only. But signs of nobleness, like stars, shall shine. On all deservers. From hence to Inverness. And bind us further to you. Here the transition to the naming of Malcolm, for which there has been no preparation, is extremely sudden, and the matter, considering its importance, is disposed of very briefly. But the abruptness and brevity of the sentence in which Duncan invites himself to Macbeth's castle are still more striking. For not a word has yet been said on the subject. Nor is it possible to suppose that Duncan had conveyed his intention by message, for in that case Macbeth would of course have informed his wife of it in his letter, written in the interval between scenes three and four. It is difficult not to suspect some omission or curtailment here. On the other hand Shakespeare may have determined to sacrifice everything possible to the effect of rapidity in the first act. And he may also have wished, by the suddenness and brevity of Duncan's self-invitation, to startle both Macbeth and the audience, and to make the latter feel that fate is hurrying the king and the murderer to their doom. And that any extensive omissions have been made seems not likely. 1. There is no internal evidence of the omission of anything essential to the plot. 2. Foreman, who saw the play in 1610, mentions nothing which we do not find in our play. For his statement that Macbeth was made Duke of Northumberland is obviously due to a confused recollection of Malcolm's being made Duke of Cumberland. 3. Whereabouts could such omissions occur? Only in the first part, for the rest is full enough. And surely anyone who wanted to cut the play down would have operated, say, on Macbeth's talk with Banquo's murderers, or on 3. 6. Or on the very long dialogue of Malcolm and Macduff, instead of reducing the most exciting part of the drama. We might indeed suppose that Shakespeare himself originally wrote the first part more at length, and made the murder of Duncan come in the third act, and then himself reduced his matter so as to bring the murder back to its present place. Perceiving in a flash of genius the extraordinary effect that might thus be produced. But, even if this idea suited those who believe in a rehandling of the play, what probability is there in it? Thus it seems most likely that the play always was an extremely short one. Can we, then, at all account for its shortness? It is possible, in the first place, that it was not composed originally for the public stage, but for some private, perhaps royal, occasion, when time was limited. And the presence of the passage about touching for the evil, for 3, 140 ff. Supports this idea. We must remember, secondly, that some of the scenes would take longer to perform than ordinary scenes of mere dialogue and action, e.g. the witch scenes, and the battle scenes in the last act, for a broadsword combat was an occasion for an exhibition of skill. And, lastly, Shakespeare may well have felt that a play constructed and written like Macbeth, a play in which a kind of fever heat is felt almost from beginning to end, and which offers very little relief by means of humorous or pathetic scenes. Ought to be short, and would be unbearable if it lasted so long as Hamlet or even King Lear. And in fact I do not think that, in reading, we feel Macbeth to be short, certainly we are astonished when we hear that it is about half as long as Hamlet. 
Perhaps in the Shakespearean theater too it appeared to occupy a longer time than the clock recorded. Footnotes These two considerations should also be borne in mind in regard to the exceptional shortness of The Midsummer Night's Dream and The Tempest. Both contain scenes which, even on the Elizabethan stage, would take an unusual time to perform. And it has been supposed of each that it was composed to grace some wedding. Note BB. The date of Macbeth. Metrical tests. Dr. Foreman saw Macbeth performed at the Globe in 1610. The question is how much earlier its composition or first appearance is to be put. It is agreed that the date is not earlier than that of the accession of James I, in 1603. The style and versification would make an earlier date almost impossible. And we have the allusions to twofold balls and treble scepters and to the descent of Scottish kings from Banquo, the undramatic description of touching for the king's evil, James performed this ceremony. And the dramatic use of witchcraft, a matter on which James considered himself an authority. Some of these references would have their fullest effect early in James's reign. And on this ground, and on account both of resemblances in the characters of Hamlet and Macbeth, and of the use of the supernatural in the two plays, it has been held that Macbeth was the tragedy that came next after Hamlet, or, at any rate, next after Othello. These arguments seem to me to have no force when set against those that point to a later date, about 1606, and place Macbeth after King Lear. And, as I have already observed, the probability is that it also comes after Shakespeare's part of Timon, and immediately before Antony in Cleopatra and Coriolanus. I will first refer briefly to some of the older arguments in favor of this later date, and then more at length to those based on versification. 1, in 2. 3. 4 to 5, here's a farmer that hanged himself on the expectation of plenty, Malone found a reference to the exceptionally low price of wheat in 1606. 2. In the reference in the same speech to the equivocator who could swear in both scales and committed treason enough for God's sake, he found an allusion to the trial of the Jesuit Garnet, in the spring of 1606. For complicity in the gunpowder treason and plot. Garnet protested on his soul and salvation that he had not held a certain conversation, then was obliged to confess that he had, and thereupon, fell into a large discourse defending equivocation. This argument, which I have barely sketched, seems to me much weightier than the first, and its weight is increased by the further references to perjury and treason pointed out on p. 3. Halliwell observed what appears to be an allusion to Macbeth in the comedy of the Puritan, 4 to 1607, we'll hot the ghost I, th, white sheet sit at upper end o, th, table. And Malone had referred to a less striking parallel in Caesar and Pompey, also Pope. 1607. Why, think you, lords, that tis ambition's spur? That pricketh Caesar to these high attempts? He also found a significance in the references in Macbeth to the genius of Mark Antony being rebuked by Caesar, and to the insane route that takes the reason prisoner, as showing that Shakespeare, while writing Macbeth, was reading Plutarch's Lives, with a view to his next play Antony in Cleopatra, s. Arc 1608. 4. To these last arguments, which by themselves would be of little weight, I may add another, of which the same may be said. Marston's reminiscences of Shakespeare are only too obvious. In his Dutch courtesan, 1605, I have noticed passages which recall Othello and King Lear, but nothing that even faintly recalls Macbeth. But in reading Sophonisba, 1606, I was several times reminded of Macbeth, as well as, more decidedly, of Othello. I note the parallels for what they are worth. With Sophonisba, Act I, Sc. 2. Upon whose tops the Roman eagle stretched. Their large spread wings, which fanned the evening air. To us cold breath. Cf. Macbeth I, 2. 49. Where the Norwegian banners flout the sky and fan our people cold. C.F. Sophonisba, a page later, yet doubtful stood the fight, with Macbeth, I, too. 7. Doubtful it stood, doubtful long it stood. In the same scene of Macbeth the hero in fight is compared to an eagle, 
and his foes to sparrows, and in sophomore 3. 2. Massinissa in fight is compared to a falcon, and his foes to fowls and lesser birds. I should not note this were it not that all these reminiscences, if they are such, recall one and the same scene. In Safanisba also there is a tremendous description of the witch Eric though, for I, who says to the person consulting her, I know thy thoughts, as the witch says to Macbeth, of the armed head, he knows thy thought. 5. The resemblances between Othello and King Lear pointed out on pages and in form, when taken in conjunction with other indications, an argument of some strength in favor of the idea that King Lear followed directly on Othello. 6. There remains the evidence of style and especially of meter. I will not add to what has been said in the text concerning the former. But I wish to refer more fully to the latter, in so far as it can be represented by the application of metrical tests. It is impossible to argue here the whole question of these tests. I will only say that, while I am aware, and quite admit the force, of what can be said against the independent, rash, or incompetent use of them, I am fully convinced of their value when they are properly used. Of these tests, that of rhyme and that of feminine endings, discreetly employed, are of use in broadly distinguishing Shakespeare's plays into two groups, earlier and later, and also in marking out the very latest dramas. And the feminine ending test is of service in distinguishing Shakespeare's part in Henry VIII. And the two noble kinsmen. But neither of these tests has any power to separate plays composed within a few years of one another. There is significance in the fact that the Winter's Tale, The Tempest, Henry VIII, contain hardly any rhymed five-foot lines, but none, probably, in the fact that Macbeth shows a higher percentage of such lines than King Lear, Othello, or Hamlet. The percentages of feminine endings, again, in the four tragedies, are almost conclusive against their being early plays, and would tend to show that they were not among the latest. But the differences in their respective percentages, which would place them in the chronological order Hamlet, Macbeth, Othello, King Lear, Koenig, or Macbeth, Hamlet, Othello, King Lear, Hertzberg, are of scarcely any account. Nearly all scholars, I think, would accept these statements. The really useful tests, in regard to plays which admittedly are not widely separated, are three which concern the endings of speeches and lines. It is practically certain that Shakespeare made his verse progressively less formal, by making the speeches end more and more often within a line and not at the close of it. By making the sense overflow more and more often from one line into another, and, at last, by sometimes placing at the end of a line a word on which scarcely any stress can be laid. The corresponding tests may be called the speech ending test, the overflow test, and the light and weak ending test. I, the speech ending test has been used by Koenig, and I will first give some of his results. But I regret to say that I am unable to discover certainly the rule he has gone by. He omits speeches which are rhymed throughout, or which end with a rhymed couplet. And he counts only speeches which are merzilic. I suppose this means that he counts any speech consisting of two lines or more, but omits not only one-line speeches, but speeches containing more than one line but less than two, but I am not sure. In the plays admitted by everyone to be early the percentage of speeches ending with an incomplete line is quite small. In the Comedy of Errors, for example, it is only 0.6. It advances to 12.1 in King John, 18.3 in Henry V, and 21. 6 in as you like it. It rises quickly soon after, and in no play written, according to general belief, after about 1600 or 1601 is it less than 30. In the admittedly latest plays it rises much higher, the figures being as follows, Antony 77.5, C.O.R. 79, Temp 84.5, C.Y.M. 85, Win. Tale 87.6, Henry VIII. Parts assigned to Shakespeare by Spedding, 89. Going back, now, to the four tragedies, we find the following figures, Othello 41.4, Hamlet 51.6, Lear 60.9, Macbeth 77.2. These figures place Macbeth decidedly last, with a percentage practically equal to that of Antony, 
the first of the final group. I will now give my own figures for these tragedies, as they differ somewhat from Koenig's, probably because my method differs. 1. I have included speeches rhymed or ending with rhymes, mainly because I find that Shakespeare will sometimes, in later plays, end a speech which is partly rhymed with an incomplete line, e.g. ham. 3. 2. 187, and the last words of the play, or map. V. I. 87, V. 2. 31, and if such speeches are reckoned, as they surely must be, for they may be, and are, highly significant, those speeches which end with complete rhymed lines must also be reckoned. 2. I have counted any speech exceeding a line in length, however little the excess may be, e.g. I'll fight till from my bones my flesh be hacked. Give me my armor. Considering that the incomplete line here may be just as significant as an incomplete line ending a longer speech. If a speech begins within a line and ends brokenly, of course I have not counted it when it is equivalent to a five-foot line, e.g. Wife, children, servants, all. That could be found. But I do count such a speech, they are very rare, as. My lord, I do not know. But truly I do fear it. For the same reason that I count. You know not. Whether it was his wisdom or his fear. Of the speeches thus counted, those which end somewhere within the line I find to be in Othello about 54%, in Hamlet about 57, in King Lear about 69, in Macbeth about 75. The order is the same as Koenig's, but the figures differ a good deal. I presume in the last three cases this comes from the difference in method. But I think Koenig's figures for Othello cannot be right, for I have tried several methods and find that the result is in no case far from the result of my own, and I am almost inclined to conjecture that Koenig's 41. For it is really the percentage of speeches ending with the close of a line, which would give 58.6 for the percentage of the broken-ended speeches. We shall find that other tests also would put Othello before Hamlet, though close to it. This may be due to accident, i.e. a cause or causes unknown to us, but I have sometimes wondered whether the last revision of Hamlet may not have succeeded the composition of Othello. In this connection the following fact may be worth notice. It is well known that the differences of the second quarto of Hamlet from the first are much greater in the last three acts than in the first two, so much so that the editors of the Cambridge Shakespeare suggested that represents an old play. Of which Shakespeare's rehandling had not then proceeded much beyond the second act, while represents his later completed rehandling. If that were so, the composition of the last three acts would be a good deal later than that of the first two, though of course the first two would be revised at the time of the composition of the last three. Now I find that the percentage of speeches ending with a broken line is about 50 for the first two acts, but about 62 for the last three. It is lowest in the first act, and in the first two scenes of it is less than 32. The percentage for the last two acts is about 65. 2. The enjambment or overflow test is also known as the end-stopped and run-on line test. A line may be called end-stopped when the sense, as well as the meter, would naturally make one pause at its close, run-on, when the mere sense would lead one to pass to the next line without any pause. This distinction is in a great majority of cases quite easy to draw, in others it is difficult. The reader cannot judge by rules of grammar, or by marks of punctuation, for there is a distinct pause at the end of many a line where most editors print no stop he must trust his ear. And readers will differ, one making a distinct pause where another does not. This, however, does not matter greatly, so long as the reader is consistent. For the important point is not the precise number of run-on lines in a play, but the difference in this matter between one play and another. Thus one may disagree with Koenig in his estimate of many instances, but one can see that he is consistent. In Shakespeare's early plays, overflows, are rare. In the Comedy of Errors, for example, their percentage is 12.9 according to Koenig, who excludes rhymed lines and some others. In the generally admitted last plays they are comparatively frequent. Thus, according to Koenig, 
the percentage in the winter's tail is 37.5, in the tempest 41.5, in Antony 43.3, in Coriolanus 45.9, in Cymbeline 46, in the parts of Henry VIII. Assigned by Spedding to Shakespeare 53.18. Koenig's results for the four tragedies are as follows, Othello, 19.5, Hamlet, 23.1, King Lear, 29.3, Macbeth, 36.6, Timon, the whole play, 32.5. Macbeth here again, therefore, stands decidedly last, indeed it stands near the first of the latest plays. And no one who has ever attended to the versification of Macbeth will be surprised at these figures. It is almost obvious, I should say, that Shakespeare is passing from one system to another. Some passages show little change, but in others the change is almost complete. If the reader will compare two somewhat similar soliloquies, to be or not to be, and if it were done when tis done, he will recognize this at once. Or let him search the previous plays, even King Lear, for twelve consecutive lines like these. If it were done when tis done, then twere well. It were done quickly, if the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his surcease success. That but this blow might be the be all and the end all here. But here, upon this bank and shoal of time, we LD jump the life to come. But in these cases, we still have judgment here. That we but teach bloody instructions, which, being taught, return to plague the inventor, this even handed justice commends the ingredients of our poison chalice to our own lips. Or let him try to parallel the following 3. 6. 37f. And this report hath so exasperate the king that he prepares for some attempt of war. Len. Sent he to Macduff. Lord. He did, and with an absolute, sir, not I. The cloudy messenger turns me his back. And hums, as who should say, you'll rue the time. That clogs me with this answer. Len. And that well might. Advise him to a caution, to hold what distance. His wisdom can provide. Some holy angel. Fly to the court of England, and unfold. His message ere he come, that a swift blessing. May soon return to this our suffering country. Under a hand accursed. Or this, for. 3, 118 f. Macduff, this noble passion. Child of integrity, hath from my soul. Wiped the black scruples, reconciled my thoughts. To thy good truth and honor. Devilish Macbeth. By many of these trains hath sought to win me. Into his power, and modest wisdom plucks me. From overcredulous haste, but God above. Deal between thee and me. For even now. I put myself to thy direction, and. Unspeak mine own detraction, here abjure. The taints and blames I laid upon myself. For strangers to my nature. I pass to another point. In the last illustration the reader will observe not only that overflows abound, but that they follow one another in an unbroken series of nine lines. So long a series could not, probably, be found outside Macbeth and the last plays. A series of two or three is not uncommon, but a series of more than three is rare in the early plays, and far from common in the plays of the second period, Koenig. I thought it might be useful for our present purpose, to count the series of four and upwards in the four tragedies, in the parts of Timon attributed by Mr. Flea to Shakespeare, and in Coriolanus, a play of the last period. I have not excluded rhymed lines in the two places where they occur, and perhaps I may say that my idea of an overflow, is more exacting than Koenig's. The reader will understand the following table at once if I say that, according to it, Othello contains three passages where a series of four successive overflowing lines occurs. And two passages where a series of five such lines occurs. 5. 7. 9. No. 
of lines. Flee. Othello. 2. 2758. Hamlet. 2571. Lear. 2. 2312. Timon. 2. 1. 1031. Macbeth. 5. 1. 1706. Coriolanus. 14. 1. 2563. The figures for Macbeth and Timon in the last column must be borne in mind. I observed nothing in the non Shakespeare part of Timon that would come into the table, but I did not make a careful search. I felt some doubt as to two of the four series in Othello and again in Hamlet, and also whether the ten series in Coriolanus should not be put in column 7. 3. The Light and Weak Ending Test We have just seen that in some cases a doubt is felt whether there is an overflow or not. The fact is that the overflow has many degrees of intensity. If we take, for example, the passage last quoted, and if with Koenig we consider the line the taints and blames I laid upon myself. To be run on, as I do not. We shall at least consider the overflow to be much less distinct than those in the lines. But God above. Deal between thee and me. For even now. I put myself to thy direction, and. Unspeak my own detraction, here abjure. And of these four lines the third runs on into its successor at much the greatest speed. Above, now, abjure, are not light or weak endings, and, is a weak ending. Prof. Ingram gave the name weak ending to certain words on which it is scarcely possible to dwell at all, and which, therefore, precipitate the line which they close into the following. Light endings are certain words which have the same effect in a slighter degree. For example, and, from, in, of, are weak endings, am, are, I, he, are light endings. The test founded on this distinction is, within its limits, the most satisfactory of all, partly because the work of its author can be absolutely trusted. The result of its application is briefly as follows. Until quite a late date light and weak endings occur in Shakespeare's works in such small numbers as hardly to be worth consideration. But in the well-defined group of last plays the numbers both of light and of weak endings increase greatly, and, on the whole, the increase apparently is progressive, I say apparently. Because the order in which the last plays are generally placed depends to some extent on the test itself. I give Professor Ingram's table of these plays, premising that in Pericles, two noble kinsmen, and Henry VIII. He uses only those parts of the plays which are attributed by certain authorities to Shakespeare, New Shakespeare S.O.C. Trans., 1874. Light. Endings. Weak. Percentage. Of light in. Verse lines. Percentage. Of weak in. Verse lines. Percentage. Of both. Antony and Cleopatra. 28. 2.53. 1. 3.53. Coriolanus. 44. 2.34. 1.71. Pericles. 10. 2.78. 1.39. 4.17. Tempest. 25. 2. 88. 1.71. 4.59. Cymbeline. 52. 2.90. 1.93. 4.83. Winter's Tale. 43. 3.12. 2.36. 5.48. Two Noble Kinsmen. 34. 3.63. 2.47. 6.10. Henry VIII. 37. 3.93. 3.23. 3 
7.16. Now, let us turn to our four tragedies, with Timon. Here again we have one doubtful play, and I give the figures for the whole of Timon, and again for the parts of Timon assigned to Shakespeare by Mr. Flea, both as they appear in his amended text and as they appear in the globe, perhaps the better text. Light. Weak. Hamlet. Zero. Othello. Zero. Lear. One. Timon, whole. Five. S.H. in flea. Seven. S.H. in globe. Two. Macbeth. 2. Now here the figures for the first three plays tell us practically nothing. The tendency to a freer use of these endings is not visible. As to Timon, the number of weak endings, I think, tells us little, for probably only two or three are Shakespeare's, but the rise in the number of light endings is so marked as to be significant. And most significant is this rise in the case of Macbeth, which, like Shakespeare's part of Timon, is much shorter than the preceding plays. It strongly confirms the impression that in Macbeth we have the transition to Shakespeare's last style, and that the play is the latest of the five tragedies. Footnotes The fact that King Lear was performed at court on December 26, 1606, is of course very far from showing that it had never been performed before. I have not tried to discover the source of the difference between these two reckonings. Der Ver in Shakespeare's Draymond, 1888. In the parts of Timon, Globe text, assigned by Mr. Flea to Shakespeare, I find the percentage to be about 74.5. Koenig gives 62.8 as the percentage in the whole of the play. I have noted also what must be a mistake in the case of Pericles. Koenig gives 17.1 as the percentage of the speeches with broken ends. I was astounded to see the figure, considering the style in the undoubtedly Shakespearean parts. And I find that, on my method, in Acts 3, 4, v, the percentage is about 71, in the first two acts, which show very slight, if any, traces of Shakespeare's hand, about 19. I cannot imagine the origin of the mistake here. I put the matter thus, instead of saying that, with a run-on line, one does pass to the next line without any pause, because, in common with many others, I should not in any case whatever wholly ignore the fact that one line ends and another begins. These overflows are what Koenig calls, Schroff and Jamins, which he considers to correspond with Furnival's run-on lines. The number of light endings, however, in Julius Caesar, 10, and All's Well, 12, is worth notice. The editors of the Cambridge Shakespeare might appeal in support of their view, that parts of Act V are not Shakespeare's, to the fact that the last of the light endings occurs at 4. 3, 165. Note CC. When was the murder of Duncan first plotted? A good many readers probably think that, when Macbeth first met the witches, he was perfectly innocent. But a much larger number would say that he had already harbored a vaguely guilty ambition, though he had not faced the idea of murder. And I think there can be no doubt that this is the obvious and natural interpretation of the scene. Only it is almost necessary to go rather further, and to suppose that his guilty ambition, whatever its precise form, was known to his wife and shared by her. Otherwise, surely, she would not, on reading his letter, so instantaneously assume that the king must be murdered in their castle, nor would Macbeth, as soon as he meets her, be aware, as he evidently is, that this thought is in her mind. But there is a famous passage in Macbeth which, closely considered, seems to require us to go further still, and to suppose that, at some time before the action of the play begins. The husband and wife had explicitly discussed the idea of murdering Duncan at some favorable opportunity, and had agreed to execute this idea. Attention seems to have been first drawn to this passage by Kester in Volume 1 of the Jarbucher D. Dutchen Shakespeare Gesellschaft, and on it is based the interpretation of the play in Werder's variable Borlesung in Uber Macbeth. The passage occurs in I, 7, where Lady Macbeth is urging her husband to the deed. Mac. Prithee, peace. I dare do all that may become a man. Who dares do more is none. Lady M. 
What beast was, then? That made you break this enterprise to me. When you durst do it, then you were a man. And, to be more than what you were, you would. Be so much more the man. Nor time nor place. Did then adhere, and yet you would make both. They have made themselves, and that their fitness now. Does unmake you. I have given suck, and no. How tender, tis to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face. Have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums. And dashed the brains out, had I so sworn as you. Have done to this. Here Lady Macbeth asserts, 1, that Macbeth proposed the murder to her, 2, that he did so at a time when there was no opportunity to attack Duncan, no, adherence, of, time and, place, 3, that he declared he wowed make an opportunity. And swore to carry out the murder. Now it is possible that Macbeth's swearing might have occurred in an interview off the stage between scenes V and 6, or scene 6. And 7. And, if in that interview Lady Macbeth had with difficulty worked her husband up to a resolution, her irritation at his relapse, in SC7, would be very natural. But, as for Macbeth's first proposal of murder, it certainly does not occur in our play, nor could it possibly occur in any interview off the stage, for when Macbeth and his wife first meet, time and place do it here, they have made themselves. The conclusion would seem to be either that the proposal of the murder, and probably the oath, occurred in a scene at the very beginning of the play, which scene has been lost or cut out. Or else that Macbeth proposed, and swore to execute, the murder at some time prior to the action of the play. The first of these hypotheses is most improbable, and we seem driven to adopt the second, unless we consent to burden Shakespeare with a careless mistake in a very critical passage. And, apart from unwillingness to do this, we can find a good deal to say in favor of the idea of a plan formed at a pastime. It would explain Macbeth's start of fear at the prophecy of the kingdom. It would explain why Lady Macbeth, on receiving his letter, immediately resolves on action, and why, on their meeting, each knows that murder is in the mind of the other. And it is in harmony with her remarks on his probable shrinking from the act, to which, ex hypothesi, she had already thought it necessary to make him pledge himself by an oath. Yet I find it very difficult to believe in this interpretation. It is not merely that the interest of Macbeth's struggle with himself and with his wife would be seriously diminished if we felt he had been through all this before. I think this would be so, but there are two more important objections. In the first place the violent agitation described in the words. If good, why do I yield to that suggestion? Whose horrid image doth unfix my hair? And make my seated heart knock at my ribs? Would surely not be natural, even in Macbeth. If the idea of murder were already quite familiar to him through conversation with his wife, and if he had already done more than yield to it. It is not as if the witches had told him that Duncan was coming to his house. In that case the perception that the moment had come to execute a merely general design might well appall him. But all that he hears is that he will one day be king, a statement which, supposing this general design, would not point to any immediate action. And, in the second place, it is hard to believe that, if Shakespeare really had imagined the murder planned and sworn to before the action of the play, he would have written the first six scenes in such a manner that practically all readers imagine quite another state of affairs, and continue to imagine it even after they have read in scene seven. The passage which is troubling us. Is it likely, to put it otherwise, that his idea was one which nobody seems to have divined till late in the nineteenth century? And for what possible reason could he refrain from making this idea clear to his audience, as he might so easily have done in the third scene? It seems very much more likely that he himself imagined the matter as nearly all his readers do. But, in that case, what are we to say of this passage? I will answer first by explaining the way in which I understood it before I was aware that it had caused so much difficulty. I suppose that an interview had taken place after scene V. A scene which shows Macbeth shrinking, and in which his last words were, We will speak further. In this interview, I supposed, his wife had so wrought upon him that he had at last yielded and pledged himself by oath to do the murder. 
As for her statement that he had broken the enterprise to her, I took it to refer to his letter to her, a letter written when time and place did not adhere, for he did not yet know that Duncan was coming to visit him. In the letter he does not, of course, openly break the enterprise to her, and it is not likely that he would do such a thing in a letter. But if they had had ambitious conversations, in which each felt that some half-formed guilty idea was floating in the mind of the other, she might naturally take the words of the letter as indicating much more than they said. And then in her passionate contempt at his hesitation, and her passionate eagerness to overcome it, she might easily accuse him, doubtless with exaggeration, and probably with conscious exaggeration, of having actually proposed the murder. And Macbeth, knowing that when he wrote the letter he really had been thinking of murder, and indifferent to anything except the question whether murder should be done, would easily let her statement pass unchallenged. This interpretation still seems to me not unnatural. The alternative, unless we adopt the idea of an agreement prior to the action of the play, is to suppose that Lady Macbeth refers throughout the passage to some interview subsequent to her husband's return, and that, in making her do so, Shakespeare simply forgot her speeches on welcoming Macbeth home, and also forgot that at any such interview, time and place did adhere. It is easy to understand such forgetfulness in a spectator and even in a reader, but it is less easy to imagine it in a poet whose conception of the two characters throughout these scenes was evidently so burningly vivid. Footnotes The swearing might of course, on this view, occur off the stage within the play, but there is no occasion to suppose this if we are obliged to put the proposal outside the play. To this it might be answered that the effect of the prediction was to make him feel, then I shall succeed if I carry out the plan of murder, and so make him yield to the idea over again. To which I can only reply, anticipating the next argument, how is it that Shakespeare wrote the speech in such a way that practically everybody supposes the idea of murder to be occurring to Macbeth for the first time? It might be answered here again that the actor, instructed by Shakespeare, could act the start of fear so as to convey quite clearly the idea of definite guilt. And this is true. But we ought to do our best to interpret the text before we have recourse to this kind of suggestion. Note D.D. Did Lady Macbeth really faint? In the scene of confusion where the murder of Duncan is discovered, Macbeth and Lennox return from the royal chamber, Lennox describes the grooms who, as it seemed, had done the deed. Their hands and faces were all badged with blood. So were their daggers, which unwiped we found. Upon their pillows. They stared, and were distracted, no man's life. Was to be trusted with them. Mac. Oh, yet I do repent me of my fury. That I did kill them. Macked. Wherefore did you so? Mac. Who can be wise, amazed, temperate and furious? Loyal and neutral, in a moment? No man. The expedition of my violent love. Outrun the pauser, reason. Here lay Duncan. His silver skin laced with his golden blood and his gashed stabs looked like a breach in nature. For ruin's wasteful entrance, there, the murderers. Steeped in the colors of their trade, their daggers. Unmannerly breached with gore, who could refrain? That had a heart to love. And in that heart. Courage to makes love known. At this point Lady Macbeth exclaims, Help me hence, ho! Her husband takes no notice, but Macduff calls out, look to the lady. This, after a few words, aside, between Malcolm and Denalbin, is repeated by Banquo, and, very shortly after, all except Duncan's son's exeunt. The stage direction, Lady Macbeth is carried out, after Banquo's exclamation, look to the lady, is not in the FF, and was introduced by Roe. If the FF are right, she can hardly have fainted away. But the point has no importance here. Does Lady Macbeth really turn faint, or does she pretend? The latter seems to have been the general view, and Waitley pointed out that Macbeth's indifference betrays his consciousness that the faint was not real. But to this it may be answered that, if he believed it to be real, he would equally show indifference, in order to display his horror at the murder. And Miss Helen Fawcett and others have held that there was no pretense. 
In favor of the pretense it may be said, one, that Lady Macbeth, who herself took back the daggers, saw the old king in his blood, and smeared the grooms, was not the woman to faint at a mere description. Two, that she saw her husband overacting his part, and saw the faces of the lords, and wished to end the scene, which she succeeded in doing. But to the last argument it may be replied that she would not willingly have run the risk of leaving her husband to act his part alone. And for other reasons, indicated above, p. I decidedly believe that she is meant really to faint. She was no goneril. She knew that she could not kill the king herself, and she never expected to have to carry back the daggers, see the bloody corpse, and smear the faces and hands of the grooms. But Macbeth's agony greatly alarmed her, and she was driven to the scene of horror to complete his task. And what an impression it made on her we know from that sentence uttered in her sleep, yet who would have thought the old man to have had so much blood in him? She had now, further, gone through the ordeal of the discovery. Is it not quite natural that the reaction should come, and that it should come just when Macbeth's description recalls the scene which had cost her the greatest effort? Is it not likely, besides, that the expression on the faces of the lords would force her to realize, what before the murder she had refused to consider, the horror and the suspicion it must excite? It is noticeable, also, that she is far from carrying out her intention of bearing a part in making their griefs and clamors roar upon his death, I. 7. 78. She has left it all to her husband, and, after uttering but two sentences, the second of which is answered very curtly by Banquo, for some time, an interval of thirty-three lines, she has said nothing. I believe Shakespeare means this interval to be occupied in desperate efforts on her part to prevent herself from giving way, as she sees for the first time something of the truth to which she was formerly so blind. And which will destroy her in the end. It should be observed that at the close of the banquet scene, where she has gone through much less, she is evidently exhausted. Shakespeare, of course, knew whether he meant the faint to be real, but I am not aware if an actor of the part could show the audience whether it was real or pretended. If he could, he would doubtless receive instructions from the author. Note E. Duration of the action in Macbeth. Macbeth's age. He has no. Children. 1. The duration of the action cannot well be more than a few months. On the day following the murder of Duncan his sons fly and Macbeth goes to Scone to be invested, too. 4. Between this scene and Act 3. An interval must be supposed, sufficient for news to arrive of Malcolm being in England and Denalbin in Ireland, and for Banquo to have shown himself a good counsellor. But the interval is evidently not long, e.g. Banquo's first words are, Thou hast it now, 3. I, 1. Banquo is murdered on the day when he speaks these words. Macbeth's visit to the witches takes place the next day, 3. 4, 132. At the end of this visit, 4. I. He hears of Macduff's flight to England, and determines to have Macduff's wife and children slaughtered without delay, and this is the subject of the next scene, 4. 2. No great interval, then, can be supposed between this scene and the next, where Macduff, arrived at the English court, hears what has happened at his castle. At the end of that scene, 4. 3. 237, Malcolm says that, Macbeth is ripe for shaking, and the powers above put on their instruments, and the events of Act V evidently follow with little delay, and occupy but a short time. Hollinshed's Macbeth appears to have reigned seventeen years, Shakespeare's may perhaps be allowed as many weeks. But, naturally, Shakespeare creates some difficulties through wishing to produce different impressions in different parts of the play. The main effect is that of fiery speed, and it would be impossible to imagine the torment of Macbeth's mind lasting through a number of years, even if Shakespeare had been willing to allow him years of outward success. Hence the brevity of the action. On the other hand time is wanted for the degeneration of his character hinted at in 4. 3, 57f, for the development of his tyranny, for his attempts to entrap Malcolm, ib 117f. And perhaps for the deepening of his feeling that his life had passed into the sear and yellow leaf. Shakespeare, 
as we have seen, scarcely provides time for all this, but at certain points he produces an impression that a longer time has elapsed than he has provided for, and he puts most of the indications of this longer time into a scene, for. 3, which by its quietness contrasts strongly with almost all the rest of the play. 2, there is no unmistakable indication of the ages of the two principal characters, but the question, though of no great importance, has an interest. I believe most readers imagine Macbeth as a man between forty and fifty, and his wife as younger but not young. In many cases this impression is doubtless due to the custom of the theatre, which, if it can be shown to go back far, should have much weight, but it is shared by readers who have never seen the play performed. And is then presumably due to a number of slight influences probably incapable of complete analysis. Such readers would say, the hero and heroine do not speak like young people, nor like old ones, but, though I think this is so, it can hardly be demonstrated. Perhaps however the following small indications, mostly of a different kind, tend to the same result. 1. There is no positive sign of youth. 2. A young man would not be likely to lead the army. 3. Macbeth is cousin to an old man. 4. Macbeth calls Malcolm young, and speaks of him scornfully as the boy Malcolm. He is probably therefore considerably his senior. But Malcolm is evidently not really a boy, ci. 2. 3f as well as the later acts. 5. One gets the impression, possibly without reason, that Macbeth and Banquo are of about the same age, and Banquo's son, the boy Flens, is evidently not a mere child. On the other hand the children of Macduff, who is clearly a good deal older than Malcolm, are all young, and I do not think there is any sign that Macbeth is older than Macduff. 6. When Lady Macbeth, in the banquet scene, says. Sit, worthy friends, my lord is often thus. And hath been from his youth. We naturally imagine him some way removed from his youth. 7. Lady Macbeth saw a resemblance to her father in the aged king. 8. Macbeth says. I have lived long enough, my way of life. Is fallen into the seer, the yellow leaf. And that which should accompany old age. As honor, love, obedience, troops of friends. I may not look to have. It is, surely, of the old age of the soul that he speaks in the second line, but still the lines would hardly be spoken under any circumstances by a man less than middle-aged. On the other hand I suppose no one ever imagined Macbeth, or on consideration could imagine him, as more than middle-aged when the action begins. And in addition the reader may observe, if he finds it necessary, that Macbeth looks forward to having children, I, 7. 72, and that his terms of endearment, dearest love, dearest Chuck, and his language in public, sweet remembrancer, do not suggest that his wife and he are old, they even suggest that she at least is scarcely middle-aged. But this discussion tends to grow ludicrous. For Shakespeare's audience these mysteries were revealed by a glance at the actors, like the fact that Duncan was an old man, which the text, I think, does not disclose till v. I. 44. 3. Whether Macbeth had children or, as seems usually to be supposed, had none, is quite immaterial. But it is material that, if he had none, he looked forward to having one. For otherwise there would be no point in the following words in his soliloquy about Banquo, 3. I, 58 F. Then prophet like. They hailed him father to a line of kings. Upon my head they placed a fruitless crown and put a barren scepter in my gripe. Thence to be wrenched with an unlineal hand. No son of mine succeeding. If't be so. For Banquo's issue have I filed my mind. And he is determined that it shall not be so. Rather than so, come, fate, into the list. And champion me to the utterance. Obviously he contemplates a son of his succeeding, if only he can get rid of Banquo and Flens. What he fears is that Banquo will kill him. In which case, supposing he has a son, that son will not be allowed to succeed him, and, supposing he has none, he will be unable to beget one. I hope this is clear, and nothing else matters. Lady Macbeth's child, 
I, 7. 54, may be alive or may be dead. It may even be, or have been, her child by a former husband, though, if Shakespeare had followed history in making Macbeth marry a widow, as some writers gravely assume, he would probably have told us so. It may be that Macbeth had many children or that he had none. We cannot say, and it does not concern the play. But the interpretation of a statement on which some critics build, he has no children, has an interest of another kind, and I proceed to consider it. These words occur at 4. 3, 216. Malcolm and Macduff are talking at the English court, and Ross, arriving from Scotland, brings news to Macduff of Macbeth's revenge on him. It is necessary to quote a good many lines. Ross. Your castle is surprised. Your wife and babes. Savagely slaughtered, to relate the manner. Were, on the quarry of these murdered deer. To add the death of you. Mal. Merciful heaven. What, man? Ne'er pull your hat upon your brows. Give sorrow words, the grief that does not speak. Whispers the o'erfraught heart and bids it break. Macked. My children too. Ross. Wife, children, servants, all. That could be found. Macked. And I must be from thence. My wife killed too. Ross. I have said. Mal. Be comforted. Let's make us medicines of our great revenge. To cure this deadly grief. Macked. He has no children. All my pretty ones. Did you say all? Oh hell kite. All. What, all my pretty chickens and their dam. At one fell swoop. Mal. Dispute it like a man. Macked. I shall do so. But I must also feel it as a man. I cannot but remember such things were. That were most precious to me. Three interpretations have been offered of the words, he has no children. A. They refer to Malcolm, who, if he had children of his own, would not at such a moment suggest revenge, or talk of curing such a grief. C.F. King John, 3. 4. 91, where Pandolf says to Constance. You hold too heinous a respect of grief. And Constance answers. He talks to me that never had a son. B. They refer to Macbeth, who has no children, and on whom therefore Macduff cannot take an adequate revenge. C. They refer to Macbeth, who, if he himself had children, could never have ordered the slaughter of children. Cf. 3 Henry VI. V. V. 63, where Margaret says to the murderers of Prince Edward. You have no children, butchers. If you had. The thought of them would have stirred up remorse. I cannot think interpretation, B, the most natural. The whole idea of the passage is that Macduff must feel grief first and before he can feel anything else, e.g. the desire for vengeance. As he says directly after, he cannot at once dispute it like a man, but must feel it as a man. And it is not till ten lines later that he is able to pass to the thought of revenge. Macduff is not the man to conceive at any time the idea of killing children in retaliation. And that he contemplates it here, even as a suggestion, I find it hard to believe. For the same main reason interpretation, seems to me far more probable than, c. What could be more consonant with the natural course of the thought, as developed in the lines which follow, than that Macduff, being told to think of revenge, not grief, should answer. No one who was himself a father would ask that of me in the very first moment of loss. But the thought supposed by interpretation, c, has not this natural connection. It has been objected to interpretation, a, that, according to it, Macduff would naturally say, you have no children, not, he has no children. But what Macduff does is precisely what Constance does in the line quoted from King John. And it should be noted that, all through the passage down to this point, and indeed in the fifteen lines which precede our quotation, Macduff listens only to Ross. His questions, my children too. My wife killed too. 
show that he cannot fully realize what he is told. When Malcolm interrupts, therefore, he puts aside his suggestion with four words spoken to himself, or, less probably, to Ross, his relative, who knew his wife and children, and continues his agonized questions and exclamations. Surely it is not likely that at that moment the idea of, see, an idea which there is nothing to suggest, would occur to him. In favor of, see, as against, a, I see no argument except that the words of Macduff almost repeat those of Margaret. And this fact does not seem to me to have much weight. It shows only that Shakespeare might easily use the words in the sense of, see, if that sense were suitable to the occasion. It is not unlikely, again, I think, that the words came to him here because he had used them many years before, but it does not follow that he knew he was repeating them, or that, if he did, he remembered the sense they had previously borne. Or that, if he did remember it, he might not use them now in another sense. Footnotes So in Hollandshed, as well as in the play, where however, cousin need not have its specific meaning. May, Johnson conjectured, without necessity. As this point occurs here, I may observe that Shakespeare's later tragedies contain many such reminiscences of the tragic plays of his young days. For instance, C.F. Titus Andronicus, I, I, 150F. In peace and honor rest you here, my sons. Secure from worldly chances and mishaps. Here lurks no treason, here no envy swells. Here grow no damned drugs, here are no storms. No noise, but silence and eternal sleep. With Macbeth, 3. 2. 22f. Duncan is in his grave. After life's fitful fever he sleeps well. Treason has done his worst, nor steel, nor poison. Malice domestic, foreign levy, nothing. Can touch him further. In writing 4. I. Shakespeare can hardly have failed to remember the conjuring of the spirit, and the ambiguous oracles, in 2 Henry VI. I. 4. The, Hurkin Tiger, of Macbeth 3. 4. 101 which is also alluded to in Hamlet, appears first in 3 Henry VI. I. 4. 155, cf. Richard III. 2, I. 92, nearer in bloody thoughts, but not in blood, with Macbeth II. 3, 146, the near in blood, the nearer bloody, Richard III. 4, 2. 64, but I am in so far in blood that sin will pluck on sin, with Macbeth 3. 4. 136, I am in blood stepped in so far, etc. These are but a few instances. It makes no difference whether Shakespeare was author or reviser of Titus and Henry VI. Note FF. The Ghost of Banquo. I do not think the suggestions that the ghost on its first appearance is Banquo's, and on its second Duncan's, or vice versa, are worth discussion. But the question whether Shakespeare meant the ghost to be real or a mere hallucination, has some interest, and I have not seen it fully examined. The following reasons may be given for the hallucination view. 1. We remember that Macbeth has already seen one hallucination, that of the dagger. And if we fail to remember it Lady Macbeth would remind us of it here. This is the very painting of your fear. This is the air-drawn dagger which, you said, led you to Duncan. 2. The ghost seems to be created by Macbeth's imagination. For his words. Now they rise again. With twenty mortal murders on their crowns. Describe it, and they echo what the murderer had said to him a little before. Safe in a ditch he bides. With twenty trenched gashes on his head. 3. It vanishes the second time on his making a violent effort and asserting its unreality. Hence, horrible shadow. Unreal mockery, hence. This is not quite so the first time, but then too its disappearance follows on his defying it. Why what care I? If thou canst nod, speak too. So, apparently, the dagger vanishes when he exclaims, there's no such thing. 4. At the end of the scene Macbeth himself seems to regard it as an illusion. 
my strange and self-abuse. Is the initiate fear that wants hard use. 5. It does not speak, like the ghost in Hamlet even on its last appearance, and like the ghost in Julius Caesar. 6. It is visible only to Macbeth. I should attach no weight to, 6. Taken alone, cp. Of, 3. It may be remarked that Brutus himself seems to attribute the vanishing of Caesar's ghost to his taking courage, now I have taken heart thou vanishest, yet he certainly holds it to be real. It may also be remarked on, 5, that Caesar's ghost says nothing that Brutus' own forebodings might not have conjured up. And further it may be asked why, if the ghost of Banquo was meant for an illusion, it was represented on the stage, as the stage directions and foreman's account show it to have been. On the whole, and with some doubt, I think that Shakespeare, 1, meant the judicious to take the ghost for an hallucination, but, 2, knew that the bulk of the audience would take it for a reality. And I am more sure of, 2, than of, 1. Index. The titles of plays are in italics. So are the numbers of the pages containing the main discussion of a character. The titles of the notes are not repeated in the index. Aaron. Abnormal mental conditions. Accident, in tragedy. In Hamlet. In Othello. In King Lear. Act, difficulty in fourth. The five acts. Action, tragic. And character. A conflict. Adversity and prosperity in King Lear. Albany. Antonio. Antony and Cleopatra. Conflict. Crisis. Humor in catastrophe. Battle scenes. Extended catastrophe. Faulty construction. Passion in. Evil in. Versification. Antony. Arden of Feversham. Ariel. Aristotle. Art, Shakespeare's, conscious. Defects in. Arthur. As you like it. Atmosphere in tragedy. Banquo. Barbara, the maid. Battle scene. In King Lear. Beast and man, in King Lear. In Timon. Bernhard, madam. Biblical ideas, in King Lear. Bombast. Brandis, G. Brutus. Caliban. Cassio. Catastrophe, humor before. Battle scenes in. False hope before. Extended. In Antony and Coriolanus. C, etc. Character, and plot. Is destiny. Tragic. Chaucer. Children, in the plays. Cleopatra. Coleridge. Comedy. Conflict, tragic. Originates in evil. Oscillating movement in. Crisis in. Descending movement of. Conscience. C. Cordelia. Coriolanus. Crisis. Hero off stage. Counterstroke. Humor. Passion. Catastrophe. Versification. Coriolanus. Cornwall. Crisis. C. Curtain, no front, in Shakespeare's theater. Cymbeline. Queen in. Desdemona. Disillusionment, in tragedies. Dog, the, Shakespeare and. Don John. Double action in King Lear. Dowden, E. Dragging. Drunkenness, invective against. Edgar. Edmund, notes. C. Amelia. Emotional tension, variations of. Evil, origin of conflict. Negative. In earlier and later tragedies. Poetic portrayal of. Aspects of, specially impressive to Shakespeare. In King Lear. In Tempest. In Macbeth. Exposition. Fate, Fatality. Flee, F.G. Fool in King Lear, the. Fools, 
Shakespeare's Foreman, Doctor Fortin Braz Fortune Freitag, G. Furnace, H. H. Garnet and Equivocation Ghost, Banquo's Ghost, Caesar's Ghost in Hamlet Ghosts, not hallucinations because appearing only to one in a company. Gloucester. Gnomic speeches. Goethe. Goneril. Greek tragedy. Green. Hales, J.W. Hamlet, exposition. Conflict. Crisis and counterstroke. Dragging. Humor, and false hope, before catastrophe. Obscurities. Undramatic passages. Place among tragedies. Position of hero. Not simply tragedy of thought. In the romantic revival. Lapse of time in. Accident. Religious ideas. Player speech. Grave digger. Last scene. See notes to, and. Hamlet, only tragic character in play. Contrasted with Laertes and Fortinbras. Failure of early criticism of. Supposed unintelligible. External view. Conscience view. Sentimental view. Schlegel Coleridge view. Temperament. Moral idealism. Reflective genius. Connection of this with inaction. Origin of melancholy. Its nature and effects. Its diminution. His insanity. In Act 2. In 3. I. In Play Scene. Spares King. With Queen. Kills Polonius. With Ghost. Leaving Denmark. State after return. In Graveyard. In Catastrophe. And Ophelia. Letter to Ophelia. Trick of repetition. Wordplay and humor. Aesthetic feeling. And Iago. Other references, notes to. Hanmer. Hazlitt. Hecate. Hegel. 2 Henry VI. 3 Henry VI. Henry VIII. Heredity. Hero, tragic. Of, high degree. Contributes to catastrophe. Nature of. Error of. Unlucky. Place of, in construction. Absence of, from stage. In earlier and later plays. In King Lear. Feeling at death of. Haywood. Historical tragedies. Homer. Horatio, notes. Humor, constructional use of. Hamlets. In Othello. In Macbeth. Hunter, J. Iachimo. Iago, and Evil. False views of. Danger of accepting his own evidence. How he appeared to others. And to Amelia. Inferences hence. Further analysis. Source of his action. His tragedy. Not merely evil. Nor of supreme intellect. Cause of failure. And Edmund. And Hamlet. Other references, notes. Improbability, not always a defect. In King Lear. Inconsistencies. Real or supposed, in Hamlet. In Othello. In King Lear. In Macbeth, notes. Ingram, Professor. Insanity and Tragedy. Ophelia's. Lear's. Intrigue and Tragedy. Irony. Isabella. Jameson, Mrs. Jealousy in Othello. Job. Johnson. Johnson. Juliet. Julius Caesar. Conflict. Exposition. Crisis. Dragging. Counterstroke. Quarrel scene. Battle scenes. And Hamlet. Style. Justice in tragedy, idea of. Keen. Kent. 
King Claudius. King John. King Lear, Exposition. Conflict. Scenes of high and low tension. Dragging. False hope before catastrophe. Battle scene. Soliloquy in. Place among tragedies, c. Tates. Twofold character. Not wholly dramatic. Opening scene. Blinding of Gloucester. Catastrophe. Structural defects. Improbabilities, etc. Vagueness of locality. Poetic value of defects. Double action. Characterization. Tendency to symbolism. Idea of monstrosity. Beast and man. Storm scenes. Question of government of world, in. Supposed pessimism. Accident and fatality. Intrigue in. Evil in. Preaching patience. And Othello. And Timon. Other references, notes to, and. Koenig, G. Koppel, R. Laertes. Lamb. Language, Shakespeare's, Defects of. Lear. Leontes. Macbeth, Exposition. Conflict. Crisis. Pathos and humor. Battle scenes. Extended catastrophe. Defects in construction. Place among tragedies. Religious ideas. Atmosphere of. Effects of darkness. Color. Storm. Supernatural, etc. Irony. Witches. Imagery. Minor characters. Simplicity. Senecan effect. Bombast. Prose. Relief scenes. Sleepwalking scene. References to gunpowder plot. All genuine. And Hamlet. And Richard III. Other references, and notes to. Macbeth, notes. Macbeth, lady, notes. Macduff. Macduff, lady. Macduff, little. Mackenzie. Marlowe. Marston's possible reminiscences of Shakespeare's plays. Measure for measure. Medieval idea of tragedy. Melancholy, Shakespeare's representations of. C. Mephistopheles. Merchant of Venice. Metrical tests, notes. Middleton. Midsummer Night's Dream. Milton. Monstrosity, idea of, in King Lear. Moral order in tragedy, idea of. Moulton, R.G. Negro. Othello A. Opening scene in tragedy. Ophelia. C. Oswald. Othello, exposition. Conflict. Peculiar construction. Inconsistencies. Place among tragedies. And Hamlet. And King Lear. Distinctive effect, and its causes. Accident in. Objections to, considered. Point of inferiority to other three tragedies. Elements of reconciliation in catastrophe. Other references, notes to, and. Othello, notes to. Pathos, and tragedy. Constructional use of. Peel. Pericles. Period, Shakespeare's tragic. Pessimism, supposed, in King Lear. In Macbeth. Plays, Shakespeare's, list of, in periods. Plot. C. Poetic justice. Poor, goodness of the, in King Lear and Timon. Posthumous. Problems, probably non-existent for original audience. Prose, in the tragedies. Queen Gertrude. Reconciliation, feeling of, in tragedy. Reagan. Religion, in Edgar. Horatio. Banquo. Richard II. Richard II. Richard III. And Macbeth. Richard III. 
Romeo and Juliet. Conflict. Exposition. Crisis. Counterstroke. Romeo. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Rules of Drama, Shakespeare's Supposed Ignorance of. Salvini. Satan, Milton's. Scenery, No, in Shakespeare's Theater. Scenes, Their Number, Length, Tone. Wrong Divisions of. Schlegel. Scott on Witchcraft. Seneca. Shakespeare the Man. Shylock. Siddons, Mrs. Soliloquy. Of Villains. Scenes Ending with. Sonnets, Shakespeare's. Spedding, J. Stage Directions, Rome Modern. Style in the Tragedies. Suffering, Tragic. Supernatural, The, In Tragedy. C. Swinburne, A.C. Simons, J.A. Tate's version of King Lear. Temperament. Tempest. Theological ideas in tragedy. In Hamlet and Macbeth. Not in Othello. In King Lear. Time, short and long, theory of. Timon of Athens. Timon. Titus Andronicus. Turgenev. Toussaint. Tragedy, Shakespearean, parts. Earlier and later. Pure and historical. C, etc. Transmigration of souls. Troilus and Cressida. Twelfth night. Two noble kinsmen. Ultimate power in tragedy. C. Undramatic speeches. Versification. C and. Wordsworth. Waste, tragic. Werder, K. Winter's Tale. Witches, the, and Macbeth. And Banquo. Wittenberg, Hamlet at. Wordsworth. Yorkshire Tragedy. Glasgow, printed at the University Press by Robert McElhose and Co. Ltd. 8VO, 12s. 6D, Net. Oxford Lectures on Poetry. By. A.C. Bradley, Doctor of Laws, Lit. D. Athenum. A remarkable achievement. It is probable that this volume will attain a permanence for which critical literature generally cannot hope. Very many of the things that are said here are finally said, they exhaust their subject. Of one thing we are certain, that there is no work in English devoted to the interpretation of poetic experience which can claim the delicacy and sureness of Mr. Bradley's Spectator. In reviewing Professor Bradley's previous book on Shakespearean tragedy we declared our opinion that it was probably the best Shakespearean criticism since Coleridge. The new volume shows the same complete sanity of judgment, the same subtlety, the same persuasive and eloquent exposition. Times. Nothing higher need be said of the present volume than it is not unworthy to be the sequel to Shakespearean tragedy. Daily Telegraph. This is not a book to be written about in a hasty review of a thousand words. It is one to be perused and appreciated at leisure, to be returned to again and again, partly because of its supreme interest, partly because it provokes, as all good books should do, a certain antagonism. Partly because it is itself the product of a careful, scholarly mind, basing conclusions on a scrupulous perusal of documents and authorities. The whole book is so full of good things that it is impossible to make any adequate selection. In an age which is not supposed to be very much interested in literary criticism, a book like Mr. Bradley's is of no little significance and importance. Saturday Review. The writer of these admirable lectures may claim what is rare even in this age of criticism, a note of his own. In type he belongs to those critics of the best order, whose view of literature is part and parcel of their view of life. His lectures on poetry are therefore what they profess to be, not scraps of textual comment, nor studies in the craft of verse-making, but broad considerations of poetry as a mode of spiritual revelation. An accomplished style and signs of careful reading we may justly demand from any professor who sets out to lecture in literature. Mr. Bradley has them in full measure. 
but he has also not a little of that priceless quality so seldom found in the professional or professorial critic, the capacity of naive vision and admiration. Here he is in a line with the really stimulating essayists, the artists in criticism. Macmillan and C.O., Ltd., London. Second edition. Crown 8 V.O., 5s. 6D, Net. A Commentary on Tennyson's, In Memoriam. By. A.C. Bradley, Doctor of Laws, Lit.D. The Saturday Review. Here we find a model of what a commentary on a great work should be, every page instinct with thoughtfulness, complete sympathy and appreciation. The most reverent care shown in the attempted interpretation of passages whose meaning to a large degree evades, and will always evade, readers of, in memoriam. It is clear to us that Mr. Bradley has devoted long time and thought to his work, and that he has published the result of his labors simply to help those who, like himself, have been and are in difficulties as to the drift of various passages. He is not of course the first who has addressed himself to the interpretation of, in memoriam, in this spirit, but Mr. Bradley's commentary is sure to take rank as the most searching and scholarly of any. The Pilot In restudying, in memoriam, with Dr. Bradley's aid, we have found his interpretation helpful in numerous passages. The notes are prefaced by a long introduction dealing with the origin, composition, and structure of the poem, the ideas used in it, the meter and the debt to other poems. All of these are good, but more interesting than any of them is a section entitled, The Way of the Soul, Reviewing the Spiritual Experience which, in memoriam, records. This is quite admirable throughout, and proves conclusively that Dr. Bradley's keen desire to fathom the exact meaning of every phrase has only quickened his appreciation of the poem as a whole. Macmillan and C.O., Ltd., London. 